This is Bazaar Morning Call. Broadcasting live from the CNBC TV 18 Motilal Oswal Studios in Mumbai. Good morning. You're with us here on a fresh new edition of Bazaar Morning Call. 8 o'clock Friday morning and uh, geopolitical tensions is what we will start this morning with. Uh, and a very different screen as compared to what the global stuff looked like about an hour ago. I mean, that's how fast things have been developing. This is, of course, we're coming to you from the CNBC TV 18 Muthi Roswell Studios. I'm Prashant. With me, my colleagues Nigel and Reema is with us here on the program as well. Guys, hi, good morning. Hi, good morning. good morning. We were all waiting for that Israel's reaction, yep. the retaliation, and it looks like it's come. The Dow Futures is down 400 points. Crude prices have picked up. Gold is nearing an all-time high level. And the SGX Nifty, one hour back, was down 150 points. Now it's down more than 300 points. Oh, so the picture's completely changed. Well, it's an action-packed day, right? You have hawkish commentary coming in from the Fed overnight. You have geopolitical tensions that are coming and taking center stage. And you have a big uh, earnings reaction as Too well. Too big. From Bajaj to, Auto and Infi. And, and Infi. And then the second half of trade, you brace yourself for HDFC Bank. Prelude to HDFC Bank. So plenty of action. And no help so far from earnings either, yeah. right? I mean, that's, I think, the other thing which we will talk about. But, uh, you know, I think uh, front and center, of course, is what's happened this morning. Just, I mean, over the last 30, 40 minutes or so. And markets have reacted uh, in, a, in a snappy kind of fashion. Uh, and I'll tell you why. So uh, geopolitical risks uh, escalate. Uh, unconfirmed reports, and I'm saying unconfirmed because, I mean, uh, it, this is a very fluid situation. I'm picking up a, a report from the Jerusalem Post, which has been so far pretty accurate. They say that, uh, uh, citing sources, they say there have been reports of explosions in central Iran, so uh, southern Syria and uh, Baghdad, which is, of course, Iraq. Uh, so, uh, you know, this is the latest which we are uh, getting. Although it's not confirmed, uh, markets will most likely assume that this is the ma widely flagged response from Israel. Now, if you remember, uh, two days back, Israel had essentially said that uh, they have no option but to retaliate. That's the quote uh, from the Israeli defense minister. So markets will assume this is that one. Now, uh, watch for more sort of headlines and, of course, confirmation of what we already put out as the day goes by. I mean, it's always better to sort of uh, get this from uh, more and more credible news organizations in terms of how these developments are uh, starting to come through. Uh, but in response to what we've got so far, look at that. Oil prices have snapped higher. They closed at 87 last night. They're 90 plus this morning. I'm talking about Brent oil prices. U.S. equity futures have uh, dropped between 1 and 1.5%, one and maybe even more. As I said, it's fluid uh, right now. NASDAQ, by the way, ended half a percent lower in any case. And futures are now indicating another 1.5% drop. Uh, the 10-year bond yield, that uh, jumped about to about 4.6%. 4, 4 but in response to this... I think we'll have to track the uh, treasury, uh, treasury futures in, here in Asia, although it's not very reliable because volumes typically are low, but in something like this, uh, you know, we'll have to see if volumes are there. But typically, yields will fall in response to something like this. Dollar index, there has been a fair bit of crowding into the dollar, and it's been a problem. So uh, it uh, got past the 106 levels, and I think this, if anything, adds more uh, it sort of will lead more people into the dollar. Dollar, of course, is where people head to in moments of risk aversion, and this is one of them, uh, I guess. Now, uh, last night, and amidst all of this, right, last night you had Fed's, uh, uh, Fed New York Governor Williams, who basically, for the second time this year, reiterated the possibility of a rate hike. I mean, if you look at the market pricing, Fed futures, etc., they did not really take the comment seriously and start to price in 5, 10, 15 basis points hike but that number now stands, the potential for a hike now stands at about two basis points. I mean, it was uh, un, uh, completely out of, the, out of bounds, right, as we began this year. But that's where, where we are at. No, no cuts and now all the way swung to the other side and now talking about, not really talking about, but possibility perhaps of a hike. At least, I mean, we're hearing this now. So markets yesterday, just to sort of tie all of this back in, saw a very sharp fall post 1.30 p.m. I mean, we were up 150, 170 points. 127. Basically, in one minute, the Nifty fell 150 points. There was a 150-point rebound. And then there was a second wave of selling, which basically took us all the way lower. So this was a pretty poor session yesterday. And you may ask the question, did we kind of price some of this in? Uh, not in the sense that we, I mean, markets knew this was coming, but the sense that, well, you know, you paid the price one day before. To some degree, that may be true, but the fact is, FIIs are continuing to sell. They've sold 20,000 crores in the last four days, and you take a look at what uh, they are doing in uh, the futures market, uh, a big jump in uh, futures uh, sort of net shot. 
uh, index net shots. That number now stands at over 1 lakh crore contracts. FI is a net shot over 1 lakh crore contracts. I mean, the peak that we've seen in the recent past, November 2023, for example, was about, a, about 1.5 lakh index contracts. And at those levels, I mean, it starts to give you an indication that maybe a bounce is due. You're getting into that zone where, uh, you know, uh, you can start to ask that question whether pessimism is a little too much on the downside, just going by positioning. But I think it's too early to ask that question this morning because this is just still developing in terms of what's happening. Uh, it also could be very opportunistic, right? I mean, these positions that FIs are taking uh, in anticipation of a response, in anticipation of escalation in geopolitics. So it could reverse very fast as well uh, as we uh, begin the uh, day and going go into the next couple of days. Just levels here, Nifty closed below the 22,117 level. It's a 61.8% retracement of the up move that we've seen, the 1,000-point up move. Support basically, to my mind, now comes in at the March low. You know, forget about 21,970. That was the first number I thought we'll get some support. But I think you're looking at 21,700, which is basically where the up move in the, after the sell-off from the Jan high started from. So 21,700 is that number. Uh, Bank Nifty. Uh, I think the supports here will come in at uh, the March low, which is 45,828. That's about 1,000 odd points away from where we left off as far as the Nifty Bank is concerned. So a bit of a flux, bit of a fluid kind of situation. Uh, so, I mean, you know, if you're trading, I, I guess uh, don't trade. That's the advice. Just uh, wait on the sidelines and uh, see where it goes because this is not something which is happening here. This is coming from headlines and markets are going to be very, very responsive to what comes our way. 380 points lower uh, uh, on the gift nifty is what the open is being indicated. Rima. You know, and the reports are of blasts and explosions in three countries, right? Yeah. Iran, Iraq, and Syria simultaneously. Yeah. So I think the street is going to be watching this. There were anyway jitters because of the ongoing Israel-Hamas war. And now it appears to have escalated. Um, so, you know, just looking at the Asian market screen right now, if you can pull that up. Taiwan is down 3.5%. Nikkei is down over 3%. The Korean markets are down 2.7%. And the cuts in the SJX50 are only getting deeper. In the morning, before these reports came out, the SJX50 was down 150 points, maybe weighed down by Infi in the tech sector, but that has now pushed up to a 400-point cut. And you spoke about 21,700 being an important support. It's also where the 100-day moving average lies. So 21,705 is the 100-day moving average on the Nifty. So we're still about you know 300 points away from that. We could get to it with the gap down opening, but it's a material gap down opening. As we said, focus will also be on individual stocks where there are earnings reaction. Infi was a miss. Infosys has a 7.5% weightage on the Nifty. The ADR was down 2.5%. But the question is, after a you know, near 15% correction that we've already seen in Infosys post the Accenture's numbers, are we getting closer to a bottom? Bajaj Auto, though, on the other hand, has reported strong numbers. And tomorrow, it's going to be HDFC Bank. So in the last 30 minutes, we'll watch for HDFC Bank. Well, that's right. Uh, remind on this geopolitical tensions, that's going to take center stage. So we'll have to wait by for sound bites that we get all through the session and hopefully if there is some kind of de-escalation or maybe in fact uh, things uh, uh, get ironed out as well. But let's uh, run you through the top points that I'm looking at for today's trading session. The FIs, well, they aggressively net shot and they're at the upper end of what we have seen in the past. The other point is that, you know, now it seems we're in a bit of a band. On the downside, the 100 DMA, on the upside, close to around 20 DMA. And you'll want that 100 DMA to get protected on the downside. Buy the dip has worked, yes, but sell on rally has also worked. And we saw that play out in yesterday's trading session. Till midway through, Yura said, well, bought the dip, it worked very well, we told you so. But in fact, you know, during the trading session, it actually reversed and you ended it virtually at the low point of the day. Two stocks that we'll be looking at. For the first half of trade, uh, Infosys will be important because that one comes out, uh, has come out with its set of numbers. So the street will be reacting to those numbers. And to the second half of trade, you'll be focusing on HDFC Bank and the exact way it just come up for you on the screen on the Nifty. What did the FIs do? Well, yesterday there was a big swing factor and I haven't seen something like this in very, very long. There were 70,000 contracts that did switch around. Because longs came down by 26,000, shots went up by close to around 45,000 contracts. And that's what takes the short positioning now to around 68%. And if you look at the bars, you know, in the last few days, you had uh, the FIs that they were net long. You know, and that came down gradually. And in fact, that's, uh, they're now net short, but close to around 1 lakh contracts on the short side. That's telling you the kind of shots that we see in, in, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, in the system. The FI is short positioning. Well, in the past, we have seen them go to around 1 lakh contracts odd. And normally, you know, we have seen in the past that we do see a bit of a bounce. The Nifty has bounced in the next five sessions. 
But to give you the exact number, in November, the highest net short position was 1.7 lakh contracts. One year ago, it was 1.95 lakh contracts. So that's the kind of short positions that we have seen. A couple of strikes come up for you in the screen. Calls were very active, 22,200 call, 22,300 call, both of them very active. So let's get straight to the levels then. The Nifty, the 20 DMA, well, that's a line in the sand on the upside. We've even broken the 50 DMA. So those will become in, uh, important resistance levels. They should come up for you on the screen. While on the downside, we're looking at the 100 DMA, which is extremely important. You know, So that's the reference point. We're going to be starting off closer to year. Will we see some kind of a short covering? That's important. And on the Nifty Bank as well, the 100 DMA becomes very, very, very important because we like to start off closer to those levels. So keep an eye out on the 100 DMA on the downside. The FIs are net short. Geopolitical tensions take center stage, guys. Okay, let's uh, get you some money market views then. Lakshmanan V of Federal Bank says the rupee has weakened over the week on the back of a stronger dollar, while forex reserves reach an all-time high at $648.5 billion. He expects the USD INR to trade in a range of 83.2 to 83.7 in the next few sessions. Okay, on bonds, we have uh, <clears throat> Lakshman and B who says that government bond yields traded higher throughout the week, mainly due to global factors. He says markets are factoring in a delayed and shallow rate cut cycle after strong economic data from the US, which led to a sharp rise in US treasuries. He says coming sessions could see the 10-year benchmark bond yield trade between 7.15% to 7.25 percent. Well, we have a lot of stock specific action track for you. We'll get to that in just a bit in our special top 10 segment. For the time being, we'll run you through the list Bajaj Auto, Axis Bank, ICIC Securities, Mahindra Life Spaces, Gokul Das Exports, Landmark Cars, GMR Airports, Sharda Motors, as well as Vesuvius. All of them will be reacting to positive news flow, while Infosys will be reacting to its numbers expected to open up in the red. Okay, let's get some perspective. Fukin Yap is senior investment strategist at Standard Chartered Bank and Peter Maguire is CEO of Exim Australia. Uh, gentlemen, good morning. Great to have both of you here. Appreciate your time as always on CNBC TV. And Peter, thanks for joining us on uh, sort of short notice. Uh, I mean, this is, of course, all, uh, you know, in a way, reacting to headlines at this stage. But oil after closing at about 87 is past 90 this morning on these reports which are coming of explosions in central Iran, etc., uh, you know, there is, of course, an immediate reaction uh, of, of because that, that region produces a fair bit of oil and then slowly the market will start to look at specifics. You know, what is the exact quantum of oil which perhaps goes out of the market if this flares up into a wider regional war? Uh, how long before where we are now and, you know, the next uh, we, we get to sort of a reason kind of assessment? And what's your own sense? Is this going to lead to a big flare up in oil prices? And I think a couple of things. First off, any market that jumps like oil, three and a half, four percent in a matter of hours really demonstrates the fragility of the market and that I, I suppose the, the premium that be, is quickly built in from geopolitical. And when you've got a number of explosions, as you've just highlighted across numerous countries, this is the sort of tension that really creates much upside unknowns in the sense of price and where that can take us. So Look, I, I, it's too hard to really... We've just got to give it a couple of hours to get a real read of it, but it's incredibly volatile. That's been washed across gold as well, and you've seen, you know, the issues, I think, are going to be um, an ongoing saga. Looks like it, and it's building to that, uh, what we've seen as far as Israel and, of course, with Iran. But, Peter, in the past episodes of, you know, geopolitical tensions, whether it's the 1990 Gulf War or as early as the Russia-Ukraine war, we've seen crude prices spike by more than 50%. Uh, you know, that's the kind of shock we've seen on the back of the supply disruption. While it is too early to say, but do you think that we could be headed there? Is there a probability that this could be one such instance? Well, I'll take it that I'm going to answer that, Remy. Yes, I do believe that that's the, that, that can happen. We know as well as anything that, you know, you see these unknowns enter markets. I can remember back in 86 when they bombed the, the flagged uh, uh, flagship uh, in the Strait of Hormuz. I think it was the Bridgeton. You know, these sort of shocks really impact markets and it, and it impacts it very, very quickly, as you have demonstrated, 50% up. Now, we don't know how much, uh, I suppose, collateral is going to wash over the market. You're going to see choke points as far as the Strait of Hormuz. What happens with the around the Baba Mandab, you know, that gulf of fears leading into the Red Sea? Does this really disrupt shipping? What happens as far as airlines? All of these factors really wash across the market. 
And that creates the geopolitical concerns and then the supply disruptions that naturally, if you've got ongoing sagas and then you've got, you know, attacks, then that can really ramp up prices quickly. And uh, yeah, I, I think we've just got to wait and see how it all rolls. But it's certainly not a, a good sign in April, considering it's, it could be a very, very delicate summer. Hmm. Got that, uh, Peter. So we'll have to wait for a couple of hours and then see the kind of reaction we get on crude. Uh, let's get in Fook as well into the conversation. Hi, Fook. Good morning and thanks so much for joining in. Well, in the past, you've mentioned that you're fairly optimistic on India's prospects, but valuations were a concern. Now we're seeing a bit of a pullback and maybe we could see a couple of percentage points more pullback on uh, the Indian indices. Will it be a good time to get in? And does India continue to remain one of your top uh, markets? Uh, and, and indeed it is. We do see India as a buying opportunity right now. We have a view now uh, to buy India large caps. Uh, the pullback has presented an attractive opportunity in our view. I mean, we, we're going to be watching, I mean, globally, you know, I think we're watching the geopolitics. And you know, as I say, historically, uh, it tends to be a short lived. And of course, if there's a protracted impact on the oil price, I think that is when it will channel into impact on the wider economy and global assets. But in terms of India, India, of course, as well, is uh, watching the oil price because it's a net importer of oil. It's very important to them. But we do see uh, the elections are proceeding uh, as expected. There's going to be continuity in the government. Growth remains very strong. We think that is attractive. So we do have a buy view now uh, for India large caps. We think it is an attractive opportunity. Fook, you want to name a couple of these uh, names that you're looking at? Because you mentioned that, yes, large caps is what you like from India. A few names that uh, you're looking at? No, I, I wouldn't be able to mention single stocks, actually, if you understand, just, just for a uh, for, for regulatory perspective. Yeah, but I mean, we do like uh, the large caps. And I said, we do like some of the uh, sectors that are like, are like industrials, consumer discretionary. But at the same time, we would balance it with a barbell approach, uh, liking uh, healthcare as well. Uh, Fook, in the past, uh, you know, most geopolitical uh, episodes have been buying opportunities, right? When does it not become one? How do you understand if the correction that we see today and which ensues in the next few days is a buying opportunity or not? Yeah, I think we're dealing with one, uh, what is going to evolve and how it's going to be evolved. Uh, I think the Iran attack was very, very, very well telegraphed. Everyone expected that. But of course, you know, how uh, Israel responds now uh, remains to be seen and how that escalates remains to be seen. But as you said, in the past, um, we do think that the psyche of investors makes it almost impossible to time the bottom, right? So what we would say is that if you want to look at a diversified foundation portfolio, for equities and bonds, if that comes out, it is an opportunity to add because uh, staying invested is going to be a very important thing and that's going to be helping you uh, to grow wealth over time. I mean, in terms of timing the bottom, is yeah, I mean, this is going to be very, very difficult for us to add any value there. Mm. <clears throat> uh, uh, Peter, uh, you know, uh, where, where do you see, I mean, uh, you've done this long enough and you, you've seen various conflicts, etc. It's an election year in the US as well, right? And uh, U.S. consumers don't want to pay higher prices. Although one can argue and say that U.S. is self-sufficient now. They're not importing anything. I mean, they're actually they're net exporters, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, but, yes, uh, I mean, they're, they're... Yeah, Sorry. go on. How does, how does all of that sort of play in with, what, uh, with what, how the U.S. is going to intervene, if at all? Well, Prashant, I mean, this is, we've got to look at the Biden administration and how they structure their um, rhetoric around this. So I don't think that they're by the, by what we've heard over the last couple of weeks, so I think they're sitting pat on this. There's no, um, they haven't offered anything as far as assistance to Israel or, or uh, I think it'd be more to the point of sanctions, depending upon if this really starts to flare up across the whole Middle East region. We don't know from a contagion standpoint, and you could have Saudi involved as well. So it's just there's there's many moving parts to this. And as you're seeing the markets up now, it's reading something into it. I mean, the market's up 4.15% on Brent. That's that's explosive. Any move that's like that, 4.2% for WTI. So everyone's long. They're all realising that's the first part. The second part is how the market appreciates this sort of is it going to wash out quickly? Is it going to, you know, give back all of those gains? Or is this going to be, you know, an ongoing over the next couple of days as far as trading and what happens tonight in New York? So, uh, you know, the, 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 again, the unknowns associated with this, it's, there are certainly uh, 
much concern from a trading perspective. And if you're looking from America, as you're saying, it's a it's a huge generator of of uh, of oil. And at these sort of prices, I'm sure that the wildcatters and all of the guys, you know, from Baker Hughes, they'd be starting to look at you know a time to if they're not in the market. They'll certainly look at re-entering the market because the prices are just so strong for uh, for uh, production. Peter, a quick word on gold and dollar index. These are the king assets in times of uncertainty. Mm, absolutely, Rima. I mean, you know, gold sitting at all time high. It's probably 42, uh, pardon me, 2430, 2435 at the moment. It's incredibly strong. Um, silver's up as well. All the base metals are up, and gold and oil. Uh, pardon me, dollar index sitting at around about one hundred six thirty. I think there's probably more upside for dollar index in the short run. That'll be a uh, you know a flight to safety in some ways. I think the currencies will come be a little bit further crushed to the downside. Euro, yen, pound, and Aussie dollar and and associated currencies. But uh, yeah, stronger US dollar, stronger gold, and by the looks of it, stronger oil in the short run. Mm. And between the two precious metals, gold and silver, what would the preference be at current levels? Oh, I think nice. No, well, you know, you, I, I'm more bullish for silver. I think there's more upside yeah. for that because you've been under investment for the best part of a decade or two decades. So the huge demand, I think silver's got, as, as I mentioned, incredible upside, but you can't discount gold. I mean, have a look at what, you know, China, India and Turkey are the three hottest uh, central banks buying gold, mm. their, their purchases are just off the charts. And uh, I don't think that appetite's going to wane any time soon from central banks, you know, buying gold and uh, they're, they're storing it like there's no tomorrow. Uh, gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us early this morning and taking us through these tenuous times. Need to get into a short break. We'll come back and talk about stocks. Our list of top 10 stocks is lined up next. Welcome back. You're tuned into Bazaar Morning Call. Well, we're bracing for a big gap down uh, this morning, but there are plenty of stocks that are going to be on our radar. So let's get straight to our top 10 segment. Rima, you go first. Infosys, the numbers are disappointing, but how much in the price? Well, that's uh, we'll come to know in the next few days. But just to put the numbers on board, Infi ADR was down 2.5%. In the Indian markets, Infi's already lost 4.5% so far this week. And since the Accenture numbers, the stock has corrected 15%. Now, Q4 was a big miss, both on revenues and margins. Revenues have fallen by 2.2%. Margins have contracted by 40 basis points versus expectations of an expansion. Now, what led to the miss? One, discretionary slowdown continues to remain the key focal point. And two, there was a one-time restructuring of a BFSI client, which impacted revenues and margins by 100 basis points. The problem is also the FI25 guidance, the outlook ahead. Uh, and that's been disappointing. 1% to 3% is what the company is guided versus estimates of 3 to 5%. So much lower in terms of FI25 growth forecast. Margin guidance maintained at 20 to 25%. And just to put that 1% to 3% number in context, TCS had reported a 3.4% revenue growth last year, and they are confident that FI25 will be better than FI24. So the street is working with about a 5 6% kind of revenue growth for TCS, while Infi is likely to end between 25 to 3%. Um, just one more question that I want to put out there. Is the Infi guidance conservative? One, we've already seen the stock fall a fair bit. And two, deal wins for the company have been very strong. 80% jump in the deal wins in the last one year in FI24, which will start ramping up. And there is a possibility of a positive surprise just in case discretionary demand comes back. Also on the margin front, while this year they're maintaining the margin guidance, uh, they did talk in their call about margin expansion over the medium term. Um, so just want to put that you know bullish case out there, silver lining, not a bullish case, which some people are talking about. Um, but we'll uh, keep getting you snippets from uh, the management at the press conference. Okay, well, uh, that's a little later uh, in the day, and we'll uh, get you uh, that as we go along. Uh, let's talk about uh, the... Uh, okay, Bajaj Auto is the stock that we're going to talk about. Sudarshan is here with details uh, on uh, Bajaj. The management, by the way, joins us a little later uh, on Bajaj. So, over to you. Morning. 
Morning, Prashant. So it's the first auto company to report numbers, and these numbers that have that have been reported are better than estimates. Even year on year, there is a healthy improvement in the numbers. Talking about the Q4 numbers, revenue has increased 34%, and margin has come in nearly 100 bips higher at 20.1%. Even profit has seen a growth of 35% year on year. And margin improvement can be attributed to three reasons: first, dollar realization; second, operating leverage; and third, favorable product mix on premiumization. In the analyst call talking about the outlook for FY25, company says it expects two-wheeler industry to grow by 7 to 8 percent in FY25 and expects premium segment to outgrow this, which implies market share gains for the company. On two-wheeler electric vehicles, company is looking to ramp up distribution to 600 stores in next six months from the current number of 200. And talking about FY24 numbers, revenue was up 22 percent and profit has increased 32 percent year on year. Thank you very much for that. And we'll have the management joining us today on Bazaar to discuss more about the Q4 performance and the way forward. But moving on to Axis Bank, Abhishek joins in. Why are you watching Axis? Well, uh, the, they have given a press release which states that along with the result, they'll also consider uh, taking a board approval for fundraise. So this will be after a long time that Axis Bank would be raising funds, although uh, it was largely known that they would be uh, looking to raise funds. Uh, bank's tier one ratio and total uh, capital adequacy ratio is at 14.2% and 16.6% respectively as of Q3 FI24. Jeffries has written a note on Axis Bank. They have a buy recommendation, target price of 1000 380 per share. They say that bank uh, would discuss capital risk prospects on 24th April, while management had indicated that there was no immediate plan uh, with CET1 uh, ratio at about 14%. The upcoming investment in Max Life would have consumed about 15 basis points, so this capital raise was in the offing. Uh, if the bank raises about 15% of their net worth, which is around 20 to 25,000 crore rupees, uh, this would mean a 7% equity dilution. Uh, capital adequacy ratio would increase by 160 basis point, while book value will actually increase by 4 to 5 basis point. ROE, however, gets uh, consumed or declines by 100 basis point to around 17 percent. Back to you. Okay, thanks a lot for that, Abhishek. Well, let's hop across to Vamakshi. She's here to tell us about ICICI Securities. Morning, Vamakshi. Well, good morning, Nigel. The company reported a good set of numbers, which is why it will be in focus today. Revenue saw an uptick of almost 17% sequentially, and this growth in revenue is largely being driven by brokerage income, which was up nearly 26% sequentially, and interest income also saw an uptick of almost 15%. EBITDA as well grew by almost 18%, and EBITDA margins have actually improved by 103 basis points sequentially to 69.9%, and the improvement in the EBITDA is largely coming from a drop in the employee benefit expenses of nearly 8%. But on the other hand, when we look at other expenses, they've gone up by almost 37% and fees and commission expenses have also risen by almost 36%. But despite that, we are seeing a very sharp uptick in the revenue, the margins has, have improved and as a, as a result, the net profit is also seeing an uptick of almost 15% sequentially. Overall, the company has also proposed a final dividend of almost 17 rupees per share. So largely, a good set of numbers, the company has announced a dividend and on the back of that, expect the stock to open higher today. Well, Marchi, thanks very much uh, for that. Let's talk, focus on a few other stocks as well. Uh, Mahindra Life Spaces, Gokul Das Exports. Sonal is standing by with that list. Sonal, morning. Good morning, Prashant. Well, the other stock, apart from these two, is Landmark Cars because they've given their operational update for quarter four. The total revenues are up 8%. The after-sales service revenues are up 13.5%. The pre-owned vehicle sales, there the revenue has jumped sharply to come in at 41 crore rupees. And the company says they have a strong pipeline for organic and inorganic expansion. Moving on to Gokuldas Exports, uh, the QIP opens today. The floor price is at 789.900 rupees a share. They seek to raise 600 crore rupees via the QIP. And sources are indicating that the indicative issue price is 775, which is around 4.5% discount to the last closing price as well. And it could be around 12.2% of the pre-issue dilution that we'll see in equity share capital. Lastly, watching out for Mahindra Live Spaces, they have sold homes worth 350 crore rupees in two days at their Bengaluru project, which is Mahindra Zen. So that stock will be in focus as well. Not for that. So now let's wind this down then with Vivek who's joining us with some more stocks in the news. Morning, Vivek. Well, good morning. You know, three stocks on my radar. First on the list is GMR Air Force. The company has closed uh, FI24 on a strong note in terms of both the uh, aircraft data 
uh, operational updates coming in both uh, in terms of traffic for passenger as well as aircraft handle. Now remember the company has domestic as well as international operations. Domestic it's Hyderabad, Delhi as well as Goa. So what's actually happened in the month of March 2024? Total passenger traffic coming in at close to 1.06 crores, which is up 10% on a year-on-year -year basis and up 5% on a month-on-month -month basis. The total aircraft movement uh, has come in at close to 68,688, again up 6% on a year-on-year -year basis and up 8% on a month-on-month -month basis. For FY24 total, passenger traffic was up 20% and aircraft movement was up 12%. The next talk on the radar is Sharda Motor. Remember the company had earlier intimated that they would be going ahead and looking at a buyback along expected lines. The board has gone ahead and approved the buyback. Now only the shareholder not is pending. The buyback size is close to 185 crore, amounting to 3.46% of the total equity capital. The buyback price is at 1,800 rupees a share and the buyback will be conducted via the tender route. And lastly, Vesuvius, remember a couple of news updates over there. Number one, the company has gone ahead and inaugurated a new flux plant in Vishakhapatnam. Flux is a component used in the casting process at steel plants. Along with that, some positive commentary coming in from the company in terms of the outlook that they see for their Indian operations. On the back of that, they've gone ahead and increased the capex outlay that the company had over the next few years from 500 crore to 1000 crore. Thank you very much for that. And there is some news on uh, Indus stars also where I think the company is, uh, you know, signed some contract and there is that QIP for Gokul Das Exports too. Let's do a quick recap then of the top stocks. Stocks with positive news flow are Bajaj Auto, Axis Bank, ICICI Security, Mahindra Life Spaces, Gokul Das Exports, Landmark Cars, GMR Airport, Sharda Motor and Vesuvius. While Infosys is the only stock on our radar with negative news flow. Now let's get a handle of all the action from the world of commodities. That's where all the action, the big moves are. Manisha joins in. Manisha. Well, thank you for that. Absolutely. After the reports of explosion in Iran, Iran is known to have activated air defense systems and has fired defense batteries. And all of this has led to uh, concerns on oil supply disruptions in the Middle East. In any case, the crude oil prices were supported as U.S. imposed sanctions on Iran and Venezuela. So now we are looking at the crude oil prices at uh, almost 4% on the higher side. And there's a lot of buying that we've seen in the natural gas prices also. There is a lot of safe haven buying that has come back in case of gold because of this. So we are back above $2,400 an ounce and very close to its all-time highs. Interestingly, the metal prices also have run up. You know, during these concerns, it always is seen that the tangible commodities always run up. In any case, the base metal prices were dealing with supply disruptions, improvement in demand, and the expectation is that with all this devastation taking place, that you will need infrastructure and construction demand also coming in for metals. Metals also are seeing improvement in demand from defense as a sector as well. So everywhere that you look in sense of industrial commodities, it seems like a very strong thing. All right, uh, Manisha, thanks very much uh, for that. So, I mean, uh, commodities once again really up there. And, you know, it's like a feedback loop, right? Commodities go up and they're an important part of uh, how inflation is calculated anywhere. And uh, that's the other leg, uh, which uh, that's the second order impact, which is that, inf uh, you know, rather than sort of trying to bring down inflation, it kind of puts in pressure on inflation on the other side. And then you get into the loop of uh, high of long and all of that. I mean, this is, of course, all financial markets, and this is all coming off on the back of the uh, sort of explosions out of Iran. Officially, we are kind of yet to hear anything uh, from either Israel or Iran. These are all uh, sort of news reports coming our way, headlines coming our way, uh, which we will continue to talk about. Siddharth so Kemke of Motoros for Financial Services is going to be with us on the other side uh, when we talk uh, specific stocks with him. Stay with us. Okay, there's also an interesting chat coming up as the first phase of the 2024 elections begin today. We get you an extensive coverage of the same when we return. Uh, lots of voices, lots of opinions, and of course, lots of on-the-ground reporting as well. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Let's talk about individual stocks. The backdrop is of immense, uh, you know, uncertainty on the political, on the geopolitical front. Global markets are in a bit of a tizzy, but right now what we have are unconfirmed reports about tensions in the Middle East ratcheting up. 
Uh, so that's gotten the street a bit worried. The gift nifty is now down 300 points. But just about half an hour back, it was down nearly 400 points. So things are still in a flux, very, very volatile. But we could brace ourselves for a bit of a gap down opening as uh, you know, confirmed news keep coming out. According to the Iran state media, and this is official, uh, which Bloomberg is flashing, and I missed that line. Uh, this, think? I think it was that uh, things are safe out there. Things that that, that, that was the second line. That was the second line. No, I think, uh, I think uh, yeah. uh, so, so, uh, Sudarshan is sort of telling us okay. that, uh, you know, there were some reports that uh, the there, were, there was an attack on the nuclear side. Okay. So I think uh, what is coming is uh, that the, the state nuclear, sites, the nuclear safe. sites are safe. I mean, it's not... Uh, uh, but that, that was some, uh, you know, there were some reports uh, to that effect about strikes on nuclear sites, etc. That is not the case. And, and there's also one more uh, thing uh, yeah. uh, where they're showing live images uh, of that, you know, Isfahan, where there were reportedly blasts and explosion. Yeah. And the roads are quiet, the square is quiet. So yeah. there is no turbulence which is being reported, at least. <laughs> you but, know. you know, I think we've... It's, it's, it's a very know, fluid they, situation. It's a it very is fluid situation. The, the, the famous terminology, right? The fog of war. You know, you want to project something, you want to say that nothing has happened. I mean, you know, uh, so we'll see. But, uh, and I think the clearest sort of indication will come in uh, how financial markets uh, react, yeah. right? If oil prices start to cool off, I mean, it's markets are nothing but collective wisdom. And, uh, you know, people with money at stake are, are going to be very, very focused on trying to figure out exactly what the situation is on the ground. Uh, but these reports, of course, will uh, keep coming and we'll keep uh, tracking this for you. But I think that is very good news. Nuclear sites, you don't want, to, you don't want the N-word entering into the picture uh, at all uh, from either sides uh, in no way uh, sort of whatsoever. And I think, uh, so small mercies, uh, that report that the nuclear site is safe, I think, is, uh, is, is uh, very, very good news. Nigel. Okay, all right. Well, let's uh, get straight then to discuss uh, about stocks. Siddharth Kemka, head retail research at Motilal Oswal Financial Services, joins us on the show. Hi, Siddharth. Good morning and good to see you in. Well, we're waking up to a lot of cues this morning, but let's focus on the top stock for the first half of trade, Infosys. Numbers are a little bit disappointing. The guidance is, well, quite tepid. However, a couple of statements with regard to the BFSI that they, it will see a bit of a pickup and some kind of optimism in terms of deal wins as well. That's what could support the stock. Your view, if it opens up down 2-3% as the ADR suggested? Yeah, so uh, very good morning, Nigel. I think uh, uh, we have been talking about uh, the macro headwinds in the near term for the IT. Uh, and that was clearly laid out by Accenture some time back. Uh, the street definitely got some uh, euphoria after the TCS results, which were better than expectations. But uh, if you look at... Uh, what Infosys has done is clearly uh, that uh, the near-term weakness consists uh, and uh, more importantly, FI25 uh, guidance cut, that is something that the street was hoping for, that things would start looking up one or two quarters down the line. That is not... Uh, happened and uh, that is kind of dampened the sentiment that there could be some recovery in the later half of the financial year. So things would remain calm for some more time is what uh, clearly Infosys is guiding. Uh, nonetheless, if you look at the longer term picture, I think uh, there is still some hope for growth. Uh, we have also cut our estimates by about 5 to 6 percent uh, for uh, FI25 in terms of the muted uh, growth. And uh, we believe that uh, one needs to definitely uh, wait out for more clarity. Within uh, IT, there are other segments or pockets. Uh, for example, some of the mid-cap or the tier 2 IT players, some of the ERD players, product development companies, which would report better growth and one can focus on uh, those segments. Mm. Any signs that Infi is close to a bottom, Siddharth? So, yeah, um, uh, uh, you know, if you look at in terms of valuations, I think uh, it's, it's closer to uh, its uh, uh, bottom. But I think one or two more quarters of weak numbers and uh, if the guidance continues to remain weak, uh, we could see some more time correction. So, the fear is not of mm. price correction that much from here. Uh, on the other side, if one or two quarters down the line, if they increase the uh, guidance, I think then... Uh, street would start looking up. But as I said, it's more of a, a one or two quarters of wait and watch for the global macro situations, which is uh, not looking that great if you look at what the US Fed commentary is or the uh, economic expectations. The, the rate cut is only going, is getting delayed, and that shows the economic picture uh, in the key markets of US and Europe, which continues to remain grim as of now. 
<clears throat> names like ONGC, et cetera, uh, Sid, uh, what's the, uh, you know, it's a big jump. I mean, it's the most kind of sort of natural response. Uh, day before, I mean, we've had big move up on oil uh, and big move up on ONGC. We got an upgrade as well early when we started the week. And then you had a slump. Uh, as oil fell from 91 to 87, and this morning we were back up at about 91. So these are very short-term sort of moves here. But any th any thoughts? Uh, ONGC and actually the entire complex, oil marketing, the standalone refiners. Yeah, so Prashant, I think uh, so. We have been positive on the entire oil and gas space, especially up, uh, the upstream oil companies. We believe that uh, after a couple of years now, they are entering into a structural uh, up cycle. Uh, with uh, increase in production volumes and stable crude oil prices. So definitely today, uh, with the global news flows, uh, crude price jumping up, uh, we will see some interest coming back to the upstream oil companies, the likes of ONGC and Oil India. But if you look at the core fundamental thesis, it, re it continues to be uh, primed on the, volu uh, well, uh, the volume uptick that these companies are able to do. Uh, and uh, the stable oil crude oil prices uh, the at, at about uh, 75 80 dollars uh, they kind of make good money uh, if you look at some of the other uh, so so production growth is something that is helping a uh, newer uh, uh, production wells for example oil india uh, three new oil wells in the andaman uh, see uh, the andaman and nicobar islands uh, it's, these are shallow uh, production wells will be commencing production uh, by mid of 2025 uh, that apart, uh, if you look at again Oil India, the uh, the Numaligar refinery capacity is being ramped up aggressively from uh, three million uh, barrels to nine million barrels. So these things would uh, be something that we are definitely looking at uh, from a long-term structural uh, story for the upstream oil company. So we continue to remain positive on both ONGC and Oil India, but at current valuations, we have a higher upside for uh, an ONGC. Oil India has seen a, a ramp up in stock prices in the recent times. Uh, but as I said, again, uh, view is positive on both ONGC and Oil India. Uh, Siddharth, Bajaj Auto's numbers continue to be fairly impressive. The company has reported a 29% revenue growth. Uh, there is uh, an improvement in realization. Their margins are back above 20%, expanding by 80 basis points. The question is how much of it is in the price. Valuations have already re-rated. Uh, I think Bajaj Auto is now trading at about 26 times forward multiple, while its peer Hero Motor Corp is at 17, 18 times. Uh, so would you bet on Bajaj Auto for more upside from here? Yeah, Rima, I think you uh, rightly highlighted we have been uh, positive on the two-wheeler space in the entire auto pack. Uh, we had, our, in, our, in terms of packing order, we, we kind of liked the two-wheeler space for last couple of quarters and that has clearly played out well. Uh, in terms of uh, results, Bajaj Auto has been consistently delivering strong results quarter after quarter. Even this quarter, uh, the numbers were much higher than expectations driven by uh, growth as well as uh, improvement in uh, the uh, the ASPs, the average selling prices. And uh, we, we expect uh, the outperformance from Bajaj Auto in the domestic segment to continue uh, led by a healthy pipeline, uh, new launch pipeline uh, as uh, the focus would remain on the domestic markets, given that uh, exports continues to remain uncertain given the global geopolitical headwinds in some of its key markets. So uh, coming to valuation, yes, uh, if you look at one year uh, forward, it is at 28 times based on our estimates. And on FY26 also, uh, the, the valuations are at 24, 25 times. So definitely a lot is in the stock price, but I would believe that on back of this strong performance plus uh, the outlook uh, by uh, the IMD on the good monsoon this year, the consumer demand reviving the rural demand, uh, two wheelers would continue to do well. Our preferred pick, uh, purely on based of valuations, would be a Hero Motocop, followed by a TVS Motors, which is a larger play on the EVs hmm. two wheeler space, uh, followed by Aisha Motors. Okay, uh, Sid, we'll come back to you uh, for more, but let's go across to Anuj now, who's standing by with a, a look at the trade setup. Anuj, good morning. Morning, Prashant. Uh, not looking good, right? Uh, there's this global mayhem. The issue is, it's tough to predict what happens. Uh, when, when some things like this, this happen, uh, 
the, the, the set of people who got it right, though, is the FIs in terms of uh, trading. I'll come to that in a bit. Uh, but anecdotally, uh, for investors, wars are the bu best buying opportunities. You have uh, numerous examples in the past, but two that come to mind, the Gulf War and the Russia-Ukraine War. Uh, I think the other important thing to track today is going to be the price behavior of Infosys because uh, the thing is whether the shocker is in the price already. ADR was down 2.6%, but it re recovered o over 5% from the lows and the stocks already down about I think 15% or thereabout since the Accenture number. So a large part of this perhaps is in the price now. But assuming EPS of 70 rupees for FY26, the stock trades at 20 times, right? And anecdotally it bottoms out at 17 times. So let's see. Uh, but now coming to trade setup and the point I was making, just look at FI as selling and it's also uh, an example of uh, why smart traders actually you know, trade more when things go in their favor. Uh, in last four days, FIs have consistently sold more, 2,000 crore, 3,850 crore, 3,150 crore, and yesterday, 7,000 crore. And just look at the contracts. Uh, we started with net long of 51,000 contracts, and we have now reached net short of over 1 lakh contracts. The record has been, I think, 1.4 lakh short contracts, uh, and net short of about, uh, uh, net long of about 11%. We are now at about 32%. So who knows whether there's more to go or not. Uh, as far as Nifty's outlook is concerned, I'm giving slightly bigger levels now because the market's moving big. 21,656 or 21,705. And then the 200-day moving average of 2,800. Uh, the day traders need to stay nimble because no level-based trade is going to work in this market. You've got to watch the screen and see how it moves. Uh, on the bank nifty, the support comes in at 46,670 to 46,800. That's where the 100-day uh, exponential moving average is placed. And the bigger support is at 45,600 to 45,700, the 200-day moving average. Keep in mind, HDFC banks numbers tomorrow. So Monday is perhaps the best time to take a fresh call on bank nifty. I'll leave you with quote of the day. And I choose this today because of a reason. Uh, the quote is about politics. It's got to be the part-time profession of every citizen who would protect the rights and privileges of free men. Today is the start of the biggest festival of democracy, India's elections. So please go out and vote if you are in the area where there's voting going on today. Okay, in fact, let's get to the big story, and that is uh, the elections which uh, kicks off. The first phase of the general election kicks off today. The voting has begun for 102 constituency across 17 states and four union territories. Uh, Parikshit now joins in with a roundup of all that you need to know for this time's elections. Parikshit. Yes, elections 2024 is kicking off. Last time in 2019, the NDA had secured 353 seats, 129 went to the India Alliance within which Congress won 52, 61 to other parties. This time, the BJP and the NDA want to take that tally above 400. Now let's look at constituencies going to polls in the first phase. There are 102 constituencies across 21 states and this is how the parties had performed in 2019. Out of these 102 constituencies in 2019, 49 went to the India Alliance, 46 to the NDA, 7 to other parties. Uh, let's also look at the key states, Tamil Nadu. All 39 seats in Tamil Nadu are going to polls in this first phase. The India Alliance had won 38 seats, majority going to the DMK, which is the ruling party. The ADMK won one. The NDA could not open its account. Now, let's look at some of the VVIP seats in Tamil Nadu, which will be crucial. Coimbatore, for that matter, will be important because you've got K. Annamalai of the BJP, fighting from there, and uh, BJP is hoping that K. Anamalai will change things around. Tutukudi, where Kani Modi of the DMK is fighting from, and Shivaganga, where Karthi Chidambaram, P. Chidambaram Sam is contesting from. Now, some of the factors which could be important, the Kachativu impact. This has been in the news because the Prime Minister has been hitting out at the Congress for giving away this uh, island to the Sri Lanka. Now, there are at least six seats where the Kachativu factor could have an impact. Let's look at some of the other states. Let's start with Rajasthan, a crucial battleground for the BJP because they had done very well here. They'd almost swept the state. If we look at uh, the constituencies going to polls in Rajasthan in phase one, this is how the party had performed in 2019. But this time, to be very careful, they have replaced at least nine or ten candidates. And from Bikaner, you've got Arjun Ram Meghwal, uh, the law minister, the sitting minister, who's trying to retain his seat. Let's uh, look at some of the other states. UP, for example, a prestige battle, always. 80 seats in UP are very important for any party looking to make a big dent in the Lok Sabha election. Now, how did different parties perform in 2019? The eight seats 
which are going to polls today. The NDA had won three seats last time around. Three went to the BSP. Two battles which we will watch closely are Pilibit, where it's not Varun Gandhi this time, but uh, Jitin Prasada of the BJP, and also Muzaffar Nagar, where Sunil Balyan, the law, the uh, Minister of State for Animal Husbandry, is actually trying to retain his seat. We're also looking at uh, battles in Madhya Pradesh and Maharashtra. Madhya Pradesh was one state where the BJP had won almost all the seats, barring one, which went to the Congress, and that was the constituency of Chindwara. This is Kamal Nath's constituency. He's backing his son, Nakul Nath, from here, putting all his weight behind his son. The BJP is trying to wrest control of the seat by putting Banti Sahu. Now, Banti Sahu has actually lost two assembly elections against Kamal Nath. So let's see what happens. Nakul Nath is also the richest candidate in this Lok Sabha election. Now, the other states which we are watching out for, Maharashtra, where you're going to see an important battle in Nagpur, can Nitin Gadkari have a hat-trick? He's fighting against Vikas Thakre of the Congress Party, who's fighting on an India Alliance ticket. The other key battles will be in the Northeast. You've got 15 constituencies in the Northeast going to polls, five from Assam. We will also be watching out for battles in uh, Bihar, also in uh, Chhattisgarh, also in West Bengal, uh, and also the state of Uttarakhand. Thank you, Parikshit. Very comprehensive there. We'll keep coming back to you for more. For now, it's time for a short break. On the other side, we'll connect with Indranil Sen Gupta, economist, head of research at CLSA India, to decode how these elections will have an impact on the market. Well, to decode how these elections will have an impact on the markets, we are now joined by Indranil Sen Gupta, economist and head of research at CLSA India. Indranil, good morning. Great to have you with us here on the program here at CNBC TV 18. Prashant, this side. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of uh, thinking whether I should start with uh, elections. And you've written a note there. And of course, the other big story is the big jump in oil prices and how the, that kind of feeds into uh, the macro equation. Let me just stick with politics to begin uh, begin with because we've addressed that uh, other bit uh, uh, earlier. So what, what what's your prognosis, uh, Indranil? Uh, you know, as someone jokingly said, uh, the, the question is whether it's going to be, you know, 320 or 350 plus or whatever. Uh, but I think markets are completely pricing in uh, the BJP and the NDA to come back. Uh, that's opinion polls are showing that absolutely clearly and starkly. Uh, so what's the roadmap for the markets from here, in your opinion, in response to uh, the elections? So I think that, uh, you know, we are not cephalogists. So we just go by the opinion polls and the opinion polls cl clearly make a case for political continuity. I think uh, as far as a BJP re-election is concerned, that is now broadly in the price. So... Uh, I think that uh, if that is uh, satisfied, um, and then I think the markets will also try to look at the other sets of factors that are going around uh, right now, you know, what is happening globally, what is happening to the Fed, what is happening with the war, and so on. Uh, if you look at the BJP's policies that, uh, you know, have come from the manifesto, I think there are two parts. The first is where they talk of macro financial stability, which we uh, interpret to mean that they will build up FX reserves, continue to build up FX reserves for external uh, security. They will continue to have uh, a strong uh, a preference for strong balance sheets, bank balance sheets, and finally, you know, fiscal discipline. So that's one part. The other is where there will be a focus on infrastructure to build global manufacturing hubs. So I think that this is broadly, as far as markets are concerned, these are the two broad, uh, you know... But Indranil, you're faces. saying all of this... Uh, Indranil, uh, this is in the price. This is all well understood, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so are you saying uh, the market uh, for sort of continued outperformance will need something more? So I think, uh, you know, right now, the markets are clearly being driven by global factors. And, uh, you know, that is something that will dominate for the time being. And in any case, you know, you're not going to get any news from uh, the elections till June 1st, when the 
exit polls come out. Hmm. Indran, we typically see a pre-election rally. Uh, the last couple of months, markets have just gone sideways. So where is that pre-election rally? And you spoke about global volatility. How does one guard against the global volatility? In the so I think that, uh, you know, we did have a rally in December after the state, yes. state polls. So that's number one. And uh, as far as global volatility is concerned, I think the RBI uh, has been building up high FX reserves to ensure that, you know, uh, beyond a point, if there is global volatility, we are also able to insulate ourselves to the extent that is possible. Hi, Indranil. Good morning and good to see you. And as you mentioned in your note, Indranil, uh, you know, global cycles, uh, they influence the Indian economy more than who rules uh, Delhi. And that's yeah. going to be rather important because in the last few days, you know, the sense you're getting is that rate cut has been pushed down maybe towards the end of the year and probably we don't get a rate cut coming in from the Fed. Keeping that sort of a backdrop, you know, what, are, what kind of action are you pricing in from central banks, both from the Fed as well as from the RBI? Because most on the street were factoring in that latest by September, we'll see some action. Your take. Yeah, so, uh, you know, obviously uh, uh, the Fed has uh, turned hawkish again. And uh, we at CLSA have pushed our first Fed cut to November. Uh, I have, in fact, in India, pushed my first rate cut to October. Uh, this is a challenge for countries like India. You see, the U.S. is keeping rates high because they have high inflation. Uh, here, we are having to keep rates high because of the Fed. Our uh, inflation numbers clearly don't warrant a 6.5% inflation rate. So uh, I think all over the world, if the present situation continues, especially for EMs, you know, this cannot but affect growth beyond a point because you are going to sit with very high real rates. Mm. Uh, no, absolutely. Uh, just the uh, other bit, uh, Indranil, oil, pr the, the jump in oil, right? Uh, now, <clears throat> there are two parts. One, we already are hearing from the US that they will not be... Uh, maybe rate cuts much later and lesser. The quantum will be lesser. The RBI, nothing uh, before the end of the year. That's what uh, some are saying. What is your own sense here, uh, Indranil? Now, with oil uh, jumping, and if it says stays up north of 90, uh, and, it, uh, and it's got the possibility to move higher, how does that, does that spoil the uh, sort of, does it raise questions of macro stability, etc.? Uh, what's the sense? See, I think uh, the stress test for oil has now moved up. You know, we all go and think of the 2008s, but then, you know, oil was at 140, but the economies were much lower. Uh, but obviously, you know, you don't want high oil for an oil importer, but we need to wait and watch whether, you know, this sustains or whether it just goes up and comes down as happened a couple of years ago. Mm. Uh, okay, got that. Just talk about the rupee as well, uh, Indranil. Uh, I mean, I, but it's not just the rupee, right? It's the Korean won, the Indonesian rupiah. Uh, you've got the Taiwanese dollar, all at multi-month lows. A rupee, of course, has been making uh, had been making lows as well. Uh, is it just yeah. is it idiosyncratic country-specific factors at play, or this is just broad dollar strength? See, it's broad dollar strength for sure at this mm -hmm. point in time. But also remember that the seasonality goes against the rupee uh, from now till September. So, you know, in India, basically April to September, you have the summer, you have the rains, production comes down, exports come down, the rupee weakens. And then come October, you know, uh, weather improves, production improves, exports improve, the rupee strengthens. So from here till uh, August, September, we will also have an unfavorable seasonality for the rupee. That is not, I think, the driver of this here. You know, it's a very clear case of the dollar strengthening because uh, the Fed uh, is sounding hawkish. And uh, our call is that once the Fed actually begins to cut, the dollar goes to 116 a euro. Uh, that's by March uh, 2025, and we see the rupee at 82 on the back of that in March 2025. But in the interim, you know, you have all this noise coming and driving the rupee up and down, and all other emerging uh, market currencies, just not the rupee. Okay, all right, Indranil, appreciate you joining in and giving us your take on how you see the entire global setup as well as the Indian uh, economy.
Thanks a lot for joining in. We look forward to chatting up with you rather soon as the elections do progress as well. Let's take a short break. On the other side, we'll have Mitesh and Srikanth who will be joining in to give us their technical trading strategies. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back. This is Open Exchange, and we are coming to you live from the CNBC TV18 Motilalo Swal Studio. Well, as promised, let's get straight to uh, the technical call on the markets. We have uh, Mitesh as well as Shrikant who are joining in. Good morning, gentlemen. Well, the gift nifty is suggesting a big gap down. Mitesh, you go first. What? How would you trade the index? Morning, Nigel. So today might not be the day to take a fresh trade on the index. My idea is that uh, you know we've been talking about a test of twenty-one eight hundred. And uh, today, it seems that we might open with a gap below that level. So then let's work out to, to the levels, you know, where the markets might uh, see some support or what are the target areas where some short positions can be booked into profits. Uh, 21,600 is the first level which I'm watching and then 21,350. So I think these are the two levels. Maybe around 21,600, you would want to take some part profits in the short positions and trade your stop losses. And then if there's a bounce back, explore uh, shorting again at slightly higher levels. The structure is clearly negative on the daily and the weekly charts, which means that over the next couple of weeks, we might see volatility and uh, this market texture would be more of uh, sell on rise. Hmm. The low is uh, 21,710, the March low, right, Mitesh? That's where, uh, I mean, logically that's a, a target. That's right. So, Prashant, I have kept the closing uh, level low as the target area. But yes, 21,710 okay. okay. will have some significance. But again, you know, that's a... Hanging one candle, so not a very important uh, this thing. But I think you know, yes, you can you can take that as one of the reference points. But yeah, I'm yeah. pretty much around there. Of... Yeah. yeah, got it, got it. Coming back to you for stocks, but Srikanth is also with us. Srikanth, uh, morning. Uh, what about you? How are how are things looking? Yeah, good morning, Prashant. Yeah, I think what you're saying is right. Around twenty one thousand seven hundred, the market is having previous swing low. As well as if we go through with averages, then hundred days simple moving average is also placed at 21,700. So that is going to act as major support for the market. But uh, by looking at the entire setup of the market, if we see the market is sustaining below 21,700, then there is a possibility that we may see the next levels of 21,500. And uh, that can be possible because if we just go through with the FIS position on the FLO segment, they are heavily short. So there is a possibility that between 21,700 to 21,500, the market uh, can fall. Uh, but in case if there is any rebound because of some any specific news flow, then close to 21,900, 22,000, we should look for creating some short positions. So on immediate basis, 21,700 and 21,900 is the range to watch out for. Srikanth, uh, any stock-specific ideas or trades? Good morning, Riva. I think, yeah, if we uh, just go through with a uh, few stocks, then in that... Uh, Apollo Hospital looks weak. I don't know what has uh, gone wrong with this stock, but it is showing a major weakness uh, from current levels and the stock can slide uh, uh, to the next levels of at least uh, 5,700. Currently, it is around 6,000. Uh, it's a short at current levels, around 6,050, 6,070 with a stop loss at 6,100. We can expect minimum 5,800 on the downside. And whenever there is a geopolitical tension sort of situation, we see some activity in metals and mining companies. So in that specifically, we are bullish on NMDC, which is currently around 235. If we see the stock is dropping to 225 or 230, then there we should look for taking some long bets uh, with a stop loss close to 220. But again, we can expect 250 on the high side. All right. Uh, got that, Shrikan. Thanks for that. Mitesh, what about you? Your picks? Nadil, I have all uh, sell calls. You know, I would avoid going long in this market, even if we see some chance to pull back. One, as I said, the structure is negative. Two, I think it will be very difficult to time the exact bottom and then the exact exit point over there. So avoid longs. On the short side is TVS Motors. It was a sell call yesterday as well. Uh, keep a fresh stop at 1966. Look for targets of 1870. Asian Paint uh, is a sell with a stop at 2830 for a target of around 2740. Excess Bank was uh, STVT yesterday. Uh, a sell call can be taken with a stop at 1036 for a target of 995 to 1990. And GMR Infra is a sell with a stop at 82 for a target of around 75 to 174. Gentlemen, thank you very much uh, for joining in. Look forward to chatting more with you as the day progresses. Pre-opening rates have settled in. It's a gap down, a lower start. 
but not as bad as what was feared. It's 60, 70 points down on the Nifty. Uh, the, at least in pre-open, the Nifty is closer to 21,900. Um, Infosys is potentially the top Nifty loser today. In pre-open, it's down close to about 5% after reporting a weak set of Q4 numbers on revenues and margins, both missing street expectations, and the company also guiding for just a 1% to 3% revenue growth next year. Uh, to talk more about the way forward, Abhishek Kumar, Equity Research Analyst at JM Financial, is with us on the show now. Uh, Abhishek, uh, morning. Um, you know, first, of course, you know, your immediate thoughts on the Q4 numbers. And two, over the medium term, what's been the extent of EPS corrections that we've seen in Infosys? And juxtapose that with the 15% fall in the last two months in the stock price. Uh, do you think we're closer to the bottom? When does Infosys bottom out in terms of valuations? And where are we right now? Uh, thanks for having me here. So first on Q4 numbers, clearly the numbers were bad, um, whether it is top line uh, or margins. Um, uh, you know, they they kind of uh, undershot the expectations. Even the guidance, uh, one to three percent was slightly below um, uh, street expectations. Uh, on the other hand, if you just, as you rightly said, if we juxtapose this uh, with where the stock has been, stock has corrected over 15 percent. Um, since uh, its recent peaks, uh, we were already six to seven percent below street expectation as far the earnings as far as the earnings are concerned. Uh, and our caution was uh, based on the fact that um, you know the initial guidance for Infosys could disappoint the street's elevated expectation. Just to give you a context, uh, most of the global uh, guidance we have seen for the calendar year 24 have been similar or lower than the actual growth they did in calendar year 23. In that context, uh, you know, uh, Street's expectation of uh, 4%, 4 to 5% higher uh, growth for Infosys for FY25 had certain risks. Um, so we were therefore a little cautious. Now this 1 to 3% while below Street's expectation looks realistic to us. Um, I think a couple of reasons. One, management indicated that, you know, uh, the seasonality for in FY25 would be uh, would be normal. That means H1 will be better than H2. That's a good sign. That tells you that, you know, the guidance is not based on some second half recovery, which is a hope, but on the actual deals in hand. Uh, so, uh, you know, that near term bias gives some more confidence and also uh, the fact that if you look at even at the upper end of the guidance, uh, the incremental revenue contribution for FY25 would be around $500 million. That's just mere 6% of the net new deals that uh, Infosys won in FY24, which was above $9 billion. Uh, so there seems to be sufficient buffer built in for further discretionary runoff. So we find uh, the, uh, the guidance realistic and it will kind of align streets expectation with the actual reality on ground. So that in a way is a good thing. Um, the stock stock might correct today, uh, but uh, I think uh, the, the further downside from here seems limited. Just in terms of earnings, our earnings now are at 68 rupees. After today's fall, the stock could be at 20 times uh, FY26. Uh, which is below its historical averages. So yeah, so in fact, uh, you know, we have upgraded the stock today and we we feel, you know, investors should buy the dips uh, today. Hmm. Uh, you said stock is a 20 times forward multiple, FI26. What is the average? And what would your fair value be for Infosys now after the upgrade? Yeah, so uh, uh, the five-year median has been 23 times for Infosys. We continue to value it at 23 times. Uh, our, our fair value is, 50, uh, you know, 1570, which is 10% up from here. And also we have to keep in mind that Infosys payout yield is 4%. Um, so, yeah, and if, if the stock opens gap up, uh, you know, the upside would be higher. And between TCS and Infosys, where is the upside greater? Because TCS is calling out for, you know, higher growth next year compared to Infi. Yes. So, see, again, we have to, uh, you know, align these with the expectations uh, for TCS. Uh, the street expectation is still 8%, which we believe is slightly higher uh, than uh, what they will eventually deliver. Um, so, just in terms of upside, uh, you know, given the valuation gap, we see higher upside in, T in Infosys over TCS. 
Okay. And um, given that INFI is just guiding for a 1% to 3% growth, and there is a possibility that TCS will end with a growth rate lower than what consensus is, do you think it's time to lower the growth forecast for the entire sector, even the other companies which have not reported? And what could be the industry growth rate in FI25? Yeah, I guess there will be correction uh, in the growth rates across the board, especially large cap. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, as the global peers have guided, uh, the growth of FY25 would be uh, similar or slightly better uh, than FY24. Um, so, yeah, I think the uh, 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 growth rates could range from anywhere between 0 to 5 percent across the top five players. Okay, 0 to 5 percent could be the FY25 growth rate for the large cap IT names. Abhishek, thank you very much for uh, joining in. Enjoy the rest of your day. 9.10, it's time to get in Mitesh's call. Mitesh. So I'll go with a sell on GMR Infra. Targets for around 75. Okay, all right. Uh, <clears throat> GMR is the one on your screen at about 78.7, 1.6 lower. We're at the end of the pre-open session as well. And, uh, you know, this is... Uh, more like it, right? I mean, the GIF Nifty, it, when we started at 8, was showing a 300-point uh, cut. Now, 130 we can take, and uh, we'll take, uh, as, as in when it uh, sort of starts uh, around those levels. Uh, but uh, unless and until the global picture improves, right, uh, and, and, and ma the market starts to... I mean, there's been an attack, there's been a retaliation, there's been a retaliation to the retaliation, and uh, unless and until this now settles down and you start to get some headlines, it's possible. Uh, that, uh, you know, that happens, uh, you know, things, uh, we need that for uh, markets to start, sort of start to stabilize a little bit. But 21,861 is where uh, the Nifty is now uh, trading at. But uh, let's uh, do a bull versus bear scenario for Bajaj Auto. So is here with that. Uh, so good morning. Morning, Prashant. So, companies reported earnings better than estimates, but there is a bull versus bear case scenario. So, first, I'll talk about the brokerages which are positive on the stock. First is JP Morgan. It has an overweight rating. Target is raised to 10,000 per share. It says Q4 earnings are 5% ahead of expectations. Management commentary was positive, and companies should grow faster due to several launches. On the back of all these, it has raised FY25, 26 EPS estimates by 5 to 6%. Next is Jeffries on Bajaj Auto. It has a buy rating, and target is raised to 10,500 per Share. It continues to like as Co expects rising India two wheeler trend and it expects 19% EPS CAGR over FY 24 26 and has raised FY 25 26 EPS estimates by 4%. Now, coming to companies which uh, brokerages which are negative first is CLSA, it has a sell rating but target is raised to 6889 per share. It expects company to gain market share but believe it believes that stock is overvalued following the recent rally. Next is City, it has a sell rating. Target is raised to 6,500 per share. It says Q4 earnings were ahead of estimates, driven by better than expected realizations. Export recovery is likely to be more gradual, but three-wheeler demand growth in FY25 should moderate versus FY24 levels. Okay, thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, Mitesh, on Bajaj Auto, um, where do you stand? The stock has doubled, more than doubled in the last one year. In the last six months itself, it's up 80%. Uh, the earnings, you know, the positive earnings surprises continue. But technically, what's the chart telling you? See, I think this is one of the stronger stocks. And uh, while there could be some pullback happening with the markets, I think I would be a buyer on decline. Let's say if you get an entry around levels of 8,600, 700 in the next coming few weeks, I think that would be a good entry point. The stock does look like it will hit five figures sometime soon. Okay, all right. I don't know whether we have time, but quickly, if you could tell us the outlook on Bharti Airtel, that one again is opened up with a gain of a percent. Where's that on headed? I think that was a DTSC call. I think the short to medium term charts are very, very positive. The stock broke into fresh highs after the consolidation yesterday. I have a target of around 1325 from a trading point of view, so I think maybe in the next couple of days we might see those levels. Uh, I think we're just sort of getting to the market open and uh, let's just sort of uh, get the first rates out and then we'll uh, look at indices and then look at stocks uh, after that. Uh, just counting down now. Uh, so, you know, it's just uh, uh, so much happening and uh, so much that the market will react to. But for sure, there are going to be lots of moves both uh, down to begin with, as you can see on your screen, and then maybe some recovery. 21,800 is where we are at on the Nifty. Uh, so 21,830 uh, uh, to be precise. The Sensex is down about 560, 530 points. 
uh, so that there's a cut, uh, three quarters of a percent is what that amounts to, uh, right at 9.15. Bank Nifty is down about 0.86%, we're at about 46,650. Uh, you've got the mid cap index down about one and a third of a percent, so there's a bit more there. And the small cap index, I think, is also should be down about 1% uh, broadly in line with what the mid cap uh, index is doing. Market breadth, 4 is to 1, in favor of declines to begin the day. Rima. Well, uh, you know, a few stocks that are reacting actually to that spike that we've seen in crude oil prices, the OMCs have taken it negatively. So HPCL, BPCL, IOC, all of them are the top losers in today's trading session. ONGC gains because of higher crude prices, but OMCs, they will feel the pressure. And price hikes are unlikely. So you have all these stocks that are lower. IOC, HPCL, as well as uh, BPCL. Uh, Interglobe Aviation, yes, uh, you know, uh, charges are moving up and cost to travel is moving up, but the input cost as well will spike up if crude oil prices are going to move up. So that stock as well is lower in trade. Otherwise, it's been a rank out performer today coming in for some profit breaking. You have uh, Canada Bank that's down close to around 2.5%, so that's seeing some selling pressure. Havels is down close to around 2%. What's gaining then? On the winning side, you have a few stocks that are up. Oil India is up, giving ONGC company. You have Exide in a world of its own. It's up close to around a percent in a market that's looking quite brittle. The number of stocks advancing are just around 255 odd. But you have to say that the start isn't as bad as feared. 160, 180 point down tick. That's par for the course, I would say. And the Nifty Bank is now close to around the 100 DMA. That's the crucial one in there. You have HDFC Bank, which will be coming out with a set of numbers tomorrow. If the Nifty Bank can see a bit of a bounce from here, it'll give some kind of support to the Nifty. This is a net short market. So any kind of support, any kind of defense of lower levels will be good, actually, from a bullish perspective. So let's see how this goes. Three well, so the top Nifty loser today is HDFC Life. They came out with numbers yesterday during market hours. But post those numbers, brokerages are lowering the target price. So HSBC has cut the target price from 800 to 750. Jefferies has also lowered it to 750 from 800. Bajaj Auto is the surprise, uh, you know, stock which has opened in the red despite strong numbers. Uh, the stock is lower by close to about 2%. Uh, CLSA has a sell call on Bajaj Auto. The target price is much lower, below 7,000, but they believe the stock is overvalued after the recent run-up. Remember, the stock in the last six months is up 80%, so maybe some profit booking. Infi opens in the red. It's down close to about 2%, and now its week-to-date losses uh, is close to about 6 to 6.5%. 6 Axis Bank continues to... Axis Bank is under pressure. Abhishek was talking about how they will be considering a fundraise along with their numbers. Nestle continues to um, see a correction. Yesterday, Nestle was down 3 3.5%. It's seeing follow-on selling pressure. And in modern, in, at least in the early rate, it's down close to about 1% odd. So these are some stocks. And others where you are seeing some, you know, news-based action, GMR Airports, Gokuldas, where there's a QIP, ICSA Securities post their numbers are also some stocks you should keep on your radar. Mm. Uh, you know, so it's of course as expected down and uh, down and out. Eight, eight uh, is to one. So our declines, outnumber advances, some eight is to one. Uh, so 1,800 stocks are lower, 250 stocks are higher. Uh, this is the broader market picture. Uh, so uh, top volume-led losers are uh, HDFC Life, as we highlighted, 4% cut there. BPCL with a 4% cut. Indigo is down 3%. Uh, Indigo at about 34.88. Canada Bank is down 3%. Canada has got a large cut as well. Uh, so I mentioned HP, BP is the other one. BP is down 4, BPCL, 4% 4 lower. Tata Communication, Rima mentioned. Phoenix down 3%. That's Phoenix Limited. Metropolis is down 35 But, you know, nothing very much on the downside as far as volumes are concerned. Uh, so while the number of stocks which is down is a long list, it's not backed by volumes. Uh, it's not in any case beyond the first six seven names that I mentioned. Uh, volumes are lacking on the upside as well. Actually, it's a slower start with regards to volumes, and maybe because participants are on the sidelines, not wanting to do much uh, till this clears out. Uh, but uh, you know, D Mart Avenue Supermarts with a three percent rise is the second biggest volume led gainer right now. Uh, ONGC, which we were discussing earlier. Uh, one and a quarter percent. These are small moves. Oil India, one. This is, this is just sort of direct play on what's happening with oil, the jump that we've seen. Apollo Hospital sold off yesterday, was one of the big movers on the downside. That's seeing a, a half a percent, one percent recovery. Cochin Shipyard, uh, you know, Transformers and Rectifies is, uh, is, I think I saw five percent, now it's up two and a half, 650 on that one. Crystal, which is the facilities management company, which uh, listed recently, had a run up early in the week. Yesterday sold off 15 percent. 
uh, Crystal is uh, up about 1% as well, so keep an eye out on that one. It's got volumes, and that's why I'm mentioning this. But overall, both on the upside and downside, beyond the first 10, 12 names, volumes are lacking. Uh, so keep that in mind uh, at, uh, at uh, this stage. Well, let's uh, get some uh, perspective uh, going with our uh, market master of the day. Harsha Upadhyay is President and Chief Oper Investment Officer Equity at Kotak Mahindra Asset Management Company. Harsha, good morning. Great to have you with us here on the program on CNBC TV 18. Uh, just a quick word, uh, Harsha, on, uh, you know, the flux we are seeing out there in the market and does it add to the complexity? Uh, you know, uh, you guys have been pointing out that valuations have been a little problematic. Uh, in January, we got a 3 3 3.5% fall, at least on the nifty larger for mid and small caps. But all of that was bought back double quick. Uh, and now, uh, now uh, we find ourselves uh, in... Uh, you know, with some uh, uh, geopolitical flare-up impacting uh, risk assets. Do you think even without this, things perhaps stay a little quiet sideways for the next couple of months? Uh, good morning, Prashant. Yes, our view remains the same. Uh, we do believe that valuations uh, continue to be the primary risk for the market at this point of time. Along with that, as you rightly mentioned, the Middle East conflict uh, also seems to be escalating. Uh, we need to watch that space and also how it uh, impacts the crude oil price. I think that's going to be very, very important, uh, not just for the crude oil derivatives, uh, but for most of the companies, the margins are dependent on how uh, crude oil behaves, either in terms of raw material or in terms of uh, fuel cost. So to that extent, I think uh, already we have seen our EBITDA margins at one of the highest levels. Uh, uh, it's unlikely to go higher even with the operating leverage. And along with that, if you have a margin uh, impact coming up because of crude oil prices, then that would be negative for the markets. And as we have discussed uh, uh, in, in the past as well, uh, current valuations, it doesn't leave any room for disappointment. So the earnings delivery is really, really crucial for the markets to sustain these levels or go higher from these levels. So to that, to that effect, I think uh, what happens in Middle East is going to be very crucial uh, in the very short term. So would you tilt your portfolio more towards the defensive, safer stocks right now? Is there any portfolio adjustment that you would recommend to tide through these times? Uh, probably not, because uh, those which are defensive seem to be struggling with their uh, business momentum. For example, FMCG has its own issues with consumption trends uh, continuing to be weak. Uh, IT, as we have seen, uh, the results have uh, continued to be weak. The outlook continues to be uh, really, really lackluster. So uh, there are no real uh, defensives in terms of sectors at this point of time. But I think uh, banking could be one where uh, probably the valuation risk is less compared to many other sectors. Uh, however, uh, I'm not suggesting that uh, the Middle East conflict is definitely going to flare up and, and, and that's going to have a longer term impact on the markets. Uh, we need to be watchful of these valuations is all uh, that I'm saying. Okay. All right. Hi, Arsha. Good morning and good to see you in. Uh, you know, when we last spoke, you were neutral on IT and with preference for large cap over mid cap. Essential, well, they sounded the alarm bell uh, out there. And now you have Infosys numbers that are fairly disappointing with benign guidance, which is weighing on the markets. What's your stance now? Do you continue to maintain the neutral stance with the preference for large cap? Uh, Nigel, probably we have uh, booked some profits in the recent times when there was a mo up move in the IT sector. So to that extent, maybe it will be slight underway to uh, benchmark at this point of time. And as you rightly mentioned, uh, the results that we have seen initially have not been inspiring. Even the outlook that has been outlined by uh, management uh, doesn't seem to be uh, inspiring confidence. Uh, most of the verticals are showing uh, uh, continuous pressure, except uh, for probably high tech and, and uh, uh, communications verticals. The overall consumer uh, discretionary spend that we are seeing uh, is also on the on the uh, lower side. So overall, it doesn't seem that uh, immediately there is going to be anything that's going to excite the markets from the IT sector. Yes, the valuations have cooled off, especially in the last month, month and a half. So to that extent, probably in a falling market, it will give you some kind of a defensive bias. Uh, but other than that, I think uh, immediately unlikely to outperform the market. Right. Uh, <clears throat> Harsha, uh, the other uh, sort of sector which has done very well is pharmaceuticals. Uh, just a quick word uh, there. We uh, had the management of uh, Lupin recently with us and we were asking them about the US generic pricing. They were saying it's still uh, the fall is in single digits. There are expectations that that actually that factor that the price fall becomes neutral. We don't know if it will swing on the other side, but if it does, I mean, that's uh, that's going to be uh, quite something. Stocks have done very well, but what's your sense, Harsha? 
Yes, on the U.S. generic pricing, I don't think uh, there is a common thread. It all depends on which portfolio each of the pharma companies are looking at and uh, at, at what stage uh, uh, they are in the U.S. generics business at this point of time in terms of the uh, new molecules, etc. Uh, so overall, uh, I, I would say that uh, it's still a sector where uh, you can have a neutral position at this point of time. Overall, domestic growth as well as uh, 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 exports growth continue to be reasonable. Uh, there are no real large regulatory headwinds at this point of time. So overall, I think uh, it, it can be a neutral exposure in the portfolios. So IT is slightly underweight. Uh, pharma is in neutral. Banks, I believe you're overweight. Any other changes that you've made? Tweaks in your uh, weighted? Uh, no, we are not overweight on banking and financials. Okay. Uh, it, uh, we do have some positions there, but it's still an underweight. Uh, most of our overweight is still in... Uh, some of the domestic cyclicals, such as industrial, cement, uh, automobiles, auto ancillaries, some of these sectors, uh, continue to bet on the, the, the cyclical part where uh, demand continues to improve. And yes, the margins may have peaked in some of the sectors, the valuations may have been on the higher side, but still, when you look at next couple of years, I think these are the segments where uh, there is going to be reasonable uh, level of demand growth and also uh, profitability growth should be higher than that of the market. Okay. Well, for the time being, the Nifty Bank has taken support at around that 100 DMA. We're seeing uh, some kind of a bounce from those levels. So that's good to see because the largest part of the market is giving some kind of support. Harsha, the other focal point today is Bajaj Auto. The numbers look good. Good margin improvement. Commentary as well, fairly decent. The problem is how much is in the price. And I was looking at two notes from City as well as CLSA. They are sounding a little bit cautious on the exports front which actually has been lacking, but they are not too enthused that in the next two years, you're going to see any kind of big growth. What's your view on the two wheelers and what's your preference out there? Uh, I won't be able to make any stock specific comments, Nigel. Uh, however, we continue to be positive on two wheelers uh, within the automobile okay. segment. After a long time, we have seen uh, volume growth uh, sustaining and uh, also the impact of uh, two wheeler uh, electric vehicles seems to be uh, uh, not as much as uh, what the market was fearing earlier. The margin uh, profile has also kind of improved. Uh, however, uh, across the sector, the valuations are not same. So to that extent, you need to look at uh, valuations from a bottom-up perspective and then take a call on the sector. But from a demand perspective, I think uh, things are fine in the sector. Okay, so just give us a little bit more color on this positive stance on the two-wheeler segment. Would you prefer the export-related name or do you you know, prefer the domestic name? Or maybe, in fact, the one that's more to premiumization, where even if EVs come in, you have larger bikes that are being sold, so it doesn't really impact them. Give us a little bit more color on this uh, positive stance that you have on two wheelers. Uh, domestic demand continues to be stronger than uh, the exports market at this point of time. Uh, and and, and uh, in terms of premiumization, I think that's across the board, not just in two wheelers. I think whichever consumer segment that you are looking at since. Uh, uh, the wealth effect has been much higher at the upper end of the economy. Uh, I think uh, the premium, premiumization is uh, still continuing. I think uh, these two trends will continue to drive overall uh, uh, um, larger uh, demand and, and will have more impact on the two-wheeler segment as far as we are concerned. I think uh, exports is still something that needs to be watched. Uh, there are certain markets which are not as good as uh, what they used to be in the past. So maybe you will need some more time for export markets to stabilize. Mm. You know, by, by the way, just a quick look at the market, right? Uh, I was talking about the lack of volumes. Well, on the downside, market breadth is still negative. If you count number of stocks down and up, it's still in favor of what number of stocks which are down. And volumes are still lacking uh, on the way down. But volumes are picking up on the way up in the broader market. All right. So I was just able to count five names with volumes, but that list is uh, becoming longer now. Uh, and uh, let me just tell you, Bajaj Electricals, for example, 2.5% higher. So there is in it just shows you interest. KM Sugar is up 9%, 40 bucks. Uh, it's got large volumes for this point in the day. Uh, there is KEI, which is up 2%. It's done very well. It's got decent-sized volumes. Premier Explosives, uh, I think 3% uh, uh, higher, uh, decent volumes. RK Forging, that sort of agreement with... Of course, the management did not confirm it, but uh, perhaps in all likelihood uh, with Tesla, uh, you know, many are agreement. Uh, stocks up uh, slightly, but there are volumes here. High tech gear is up two and a half percent, and it's picking up. Uh, that's the point that I'm wanting to make on the uh, way up, even though overall uh, numerically uh, declines outnumber advances. Harsha, just one quick word on uh, flows. You know, we were talking about the last month uh, Amphi numbers, and you know, we saw a shift away from small cap 
uh, funds, etc., into towards large caps. Uh, has that continued uh, into ap into April so far? <coughs> uh uh, yes, in a way, I think uh, the overall numbers in, in mid and small cap category seems to have been slightly lower than the trend number that we used to see for the entire financial year last year. Uh, however, uh, I mean, it's too early to call out that uh, uh, the small cap flows or the mid cap flows are going to uh, definitely reverse uh, from here on. I think it's just a bit of uh, uh, valuation concerns that's running on the minds of most of the investors and probably some profit booking that's also happening. Arsha, great conversation. Thank you very much for joining us on this important day. Uh, moving on now to Bajaj Auto. That's under pressure despite reporting a strong set of Q4 earnings. The company's margins have expanded by 80 basis points to 20.1%. Revenue performance looks good above street expectation and profits have seen a more than 30% jump. Rakesh Sharma, ED of Bajaj Auto, is with us on the show now. Uh, Mr. Sharma, you know, morning and thank you very much for joining in. In the call yesterday, you have said that the industry growth will be 7 to 8% in FI25 and the company will do better given your rising share of, you know, 125cc+. plus. Now, the question is, can your volume growth be in double digit? Last year, you did 10.4%. Can you do better than last year, you know, in FI25? Uh, good morning. <clears throat> Well, that certainly is the uh, aspiration. And if you just take the recent past uh, of, let's say, quarter four, we have grown twice the rate of uh, the industry growth. And uh, in the 125 CC plus, the upper half of the uh, industry, we have grown four times that of the industry size. Now, this has been driven by largely, uh, you know, the slew of new launches, which have uh, been very well received in the Pulsar brand. Uh, so we have already got traction and we have confident that this should continue. So if the industry returns something like a 7 to 8% growth, I'm expecting that the structure of the growth will be similar, which is the top half will grow faster uh, than the bottom half, and we will grow faster than. Uh, uh, the industry in both the top half and the bottom. Do you want to put a number to that? Faster, could it be 2x well, if 7 to 8% is the industry? Can you repeat the performance of Q4 and grow 15%? I uh, would not be able to give you a precise number, but I have told you a very good indicator of future performance is the recent uh, past. And uh, if the industry grows at 7 to 8%, I have uh, no reason to believe, uh, given the track record, that why we should not be in double digits. We would certainly be uh, driving for a double digit growth. Okay, all right. Hi, Mr. Sharma. Good morning and good to see you, Ben. You're sounding pretty optimistic in terms of growth and your margins as well clocked more than 20% for the second quarter running. But before we get to the margins, I want to ask you about exports. You know, the last few years, last two years at least, you've seen a bit of a degrowth out there and that's a uh, you know, that's what the industry has been under pressure. I think it's still 25% off the peak that we saw in FY22. Now, the bullish sentiment on the street is that you'll at least see, you know, 11 to a 15 percent growth in exports for this year. Do you believe that that's uh, possible for uh, the coming year? That's FY25 as well as FY26. That's the rough per annum growth that the street is factoring in. So, you know, the way to uh, look at exports now is uh, that we have to start to segment the market, uh, overseas markets. Now, we cannot... Uh, you know, uh, paint the entire uh, world with the same uh, brush because there are there is a so we have, what we have done for our uh, financial uh, year 25 planning is to uh, segregate the markets in three buckets. The first are the stressed markets. Unfortunately, some of our large markets like Nigeria and Bangladesh are in that. We've taken a very very sanguine view uh, about uh, what to expect. Uh, in these uh, markets. We will roll with um, uh, how things go uh, in those markets. Then there are the, uh, most of the other markets, they are showing a very good recovery, particularly in Latin America and now uh, ASEAN, Philippines, uh, etc. Here we have assumed a very aggressive uh, stance, again on the basis of our recent success, particularly in Latin America, for example, our growth in Latin America has been, in Pulse, has been 26%. And that has affected both the bottom line and the top line, uh, as you can imagine. And then there is the third bucket, which is some of the new markets, which will sort of start to kick in, but not in a very, very significant way. 
these are places like you know uh, brazil where our new plant comes on stream in may which will uh, help us unlock pent up demand and expand the network footprint these are places like venezuela these are uh, we are making an entry into europe which hopefully by the second half or let's say at least the last quarter of the financial year uh, will start to uh, uh, show some impact so therefore when we uh, despite taking a conservative view of these troubled markets we feel that fy25 will be certainly better than fy24 but having said all that you must also keep in mind that there is a base effect if, uh, also which will uh, start to show up uh, in the growth numbers mr sharma is there a uh, you've you've alluded to in the in the past uh, some of the macro variables, right? Uh, dollar, for example, dollar shortage in many African markets. Dollar is on the rise, uh, Mr. Sharma, in a, in a meaningful way. Uh, and it perhaps the forecasts are, I mean, we are not experts, but forecasts are that, uh, you know, there is, there is upside risk here. Does that become a bit of a headwind, especially in some of these uh, African markets for you uh, and, and impede any recovery that you may be seeing there if that trend continues? Or do you think the worst is behind? Well, you know, after the passage of last year, I'm very, very loath to say that the worst is behind us because <laughs> the situation on the currency end is uh, quite fragile still. And uh, that is the reason why I said we've taken a sanguine view of some of these uh, markets in our planning and we will just roll along. And you are right. It is, uh, you know, the single most important challenge which we are uh, facing. And it's not just the availability of the currency, which I must say uh, is uh, improving, but it is also the, uh, the inflation caused by the devaluation. So uh, the, the purchasing power to begin with in these economies is not very high. And uh, the consumer takes time to digest uh, the price increases which are due to the uh, devaluation. So that factor is also over there. Uh, Mr. Sharma, what's the planning on margins for FI25? Uh, in Q4, the commodity basket was fairly neutral for you. But in Q1, we've started seeing a rise, particularly in copper prices. Aluminium prices too have inched up. So is there a risk? Well, I won't say there is a risk. We also noticed this uh, slight uh, uptick. And we have actually been very proactive. And we have taken a little bit of a price increase on uh, 1st of April just so that, you know, uh, we are uh, at pace with these expected uh, cost increases. But having said that, uh, 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 some a lot of these cost increases are also getting neutralized by some reductions, gentle reductions, which we are seeing in, uh, you know, noble metals, etc. And then, of course, there is the uh, gentle devaluation of the dollar, which... Uh, uh, particularly in the last six to eight weeks, we have noticed the realizations are uh, improving. So uh, that is very, very uh, helpful. So when you uh, combine all this, then uh, at least at the as we stand, uh, we are not really uh, so concerned about uh, the margin uh, outlook. And I must just so remind you, and I must just sort of point this out, that though our EV, two-wheeler EV business has, uh, you know, uh, gained substantially, I mean, uh, it's gone from, uh, uh, we are now clocking 10, 15, uh, 15,000, 14, 15,000 units per month, which as you all know that uh, the margins are uh, lower than the corporate margins, but thanks to some of the cost uh, uh, saving work and R&D work, as well as sourcing work, supply chain work, We've been able to uh, mitigate the impact on margins of the substantive rise in the electric two-wheeler business. Uh, just a quick word. How much lower are the EV margins versus ICE margins for you? See, we don't get into segmental level uh, margins, but obviously they are lower than the uh, corporate margins. On a unit level, it's loss making? Well, like I said, we don't get into the unit level descriptions <laughs> and uh, all that. But uh, of course, uh, these are uh, much lower than the corporate margins which we have. And Bajaj Auto margins are a blended margin between international, domestic, three-wheelers, premium bikes, entry-level bikes, etc. 
We'll let you go at that then, Mr. Sharma, but we're looking forward to having a chat with you maybe by the end of uh, the month when we get your monthly numbers as well. Wishing you a good day ahead. Thank you For the much. time being, though, we'll slip into a short break. Up next, we'll connect with Mr. Dinesh Thakkar, the CMT of Angel One, to discuss their quarterly numbers. Welcome back. Some stability in the markets. It's not as bad as we thought earlier this morning, and that's for the good. Uh, you know, good for the for the entire globe if uh, there's not going to be escalation, and good for the financial markets as well. We're down only around 140 points odd. Let's focus on Angel One, though. It reported a strong set of numbers at the end of uh, quarter four. The company has done a healthy client addition in quarter four, while their margins as well have improved a little bit. The management in the conference call said that they will sustain their growth going ahead. So let's get straight to a discussion with uh, Mr. Dinesh Tucker, the CMD of Angel One. Hi, Mr. Tucker. Good morning, and thanks a lot for joining Good in. Good morning. Well, Thank let's you focus much. on your client edition. Yes, it's been healthy, but uh, your monthly updates suggest that the gross client edition has slowed down a little bit for the third consecutive quarter. How should we view this? I do not see any slowdown in uh, new acquisition that uh, we are doing. In fact, this quarter we did around 20, uh, 29 lakh customer, which is higher than previous quarter. And uh, if you look at uh, like uh, customers that we are acquiring, they are from the same kind of a demography of mostly coming from tier two and beyond, which is around 85 to 90% of our clients that we acquire. So overall, I see this healthy trend Small deviation here and then month on month can be there because March was a bit lower than Feb, but it was very high in compared to our year on year growth. Because when we started this year, we were acquiring around 4 lakh customer. Yes. And in this, uh, in this quarter, we acquired 29. That means average of around 9 lakh and above. So you expect that sort of a run rate uh, to keep pace around 9 lakh on a monthly basis? Yeah, we expect uh, that this kind of like run rate would be able to maintain, continue. In fact, we are expecting an increase in run rate because now just uh, like in this quarter, we have started uh, sponsoring on IPL branding activity and all that. So mm -hmm. we feel that that is going to help us acquire more customer from that area or demography or uh, tier two and tier three that we are aiming for. Because what is important is top of the mind recall that a customer has when they are yeah. thinking about opening a broking account. So we feel that so, is going to help us in terms of accelerating this trend. Okay. Mr. Tucker, uh, good morning, Prashant here. Good to see you, sir. Hi, Prashant. Uh, just, uh, just a couple of points. Uh, one, in the month of the March, uh, when you look at the, uh, we get the d d -mat, number of DMATS account, etc. there was a small dip. Uh, not, I'm not talking about angel, but I'm talking about overall industry. I mean, the rate of growth actually came off. Uh, so I don't know if you have any thoughts there. I mean, is this the first sign of maybe uh, or, or, or that's not really true and April things have picked up, uh, Mr. Tucker? No, it is very relative. Uh, say if you compare with Feb, it appears to be there was a bit dip. But if you compare with uh, October, November, we are seeing sustained growth which started from December, it continues. So there can be a variance of 10% here and there because uh, I think uh, by October, uh, uh, November, October, we were acquiring around 6 to 7 lakh customers. And then we jumped to 10 lakh. Then it came down to around eight and a half, nine lakh. So that dip is, I would say, a regular dip in terms of cyclicity of this uh, kind of an industry market. So clients uh, are more active when uh, market is uh, going up. Small and mid caps are going up in Jan and Feb, if you remember. So this 10% impact would be there. But if you look at year on year growth, I think it would be quite uh, reasonable to say this industry will grow at a good rate. Plus, digital players are going to grow at a decent rate. Would they be? Uh, would uh, what, what, what about margins, Mr. Tucker? If you can give us some uh, sense there, uh, because as you said, I mean, there is you're spending of uh, you, you will be spending, and you're in the uh, sort of OPEX phase, a bit of CAPEX as well, right? As you build out some of the other new businesses, uh, wealth management, etc. There is uh, the IPL spending as well, which of course will get you more recall down the line. Uh, will uh, will will sort of top line growth more than make up for? Uh, you know this all of this spending and what does that mean for margins should margins will margins be a little subdued in 25 as opposed to uh, 24 
See, Prashant, the way we look at is that uh, we have to take out sales cost when we are looking at uh, our margins. Because when we spend on sales, we book our uh, this thing uh, cost immediately. But if you look at lifetime value of a customer, so this time we had uh, revealed all that numbers that when we are clocking any revenue for any year, it is a combination of vintage customers who are uh, one year, two year, three years, five years old. But when we acquired this customer, we had booked our uh, uh, cost immediately in that very quarter. So there are two ways to looking at margin. One, we get an opportunity to acquire more customer. There would be an impact on overall OPM. But if I apportion this cost for five years, looking at the lifetime value of a customer, we would be at the same kind of an OPM what uh, we have achieved this year. So for us to maintain this OPM of 45 to 50% is quite, I would say, comfortable. But if we get an opportunity to acquire more customer, it is an affronted cost for which revenue is going to come in subsequent years. So overall, uh, if somebody is looking at our model, they should look uh, cost that we are taking to acquire customer. It has to be apportioned for five years. If we do that, then OPM, it is not there. But even if I take cost of uh, branding and cost of uh, sales that we do every year, our OPM would be within this range of around 44 to 45%, inclusive of all the cost that we are spending on sales, that we are spending on new businesses. What's the amount that you're planning to sell, uh, spend on sales, marketing, branding, X of the amount that you've planned for IPL this year? Uh, Usually, we don't disclose uh, that uh, amount that we are going to spend on sales because it is a composite number. But we have disclosed because IPL number are there in the market. But we have disclosed in terms of how much we are going to spend on this IPL. I being, IPL being a new property, we wanted everybody to know about that number. And sure. when we achieve some traction in terms of client acquisition, it is easy for us to really uh, mm. portion that cost or justify that cost. Okay. So you've given us a number on the gross client edition and you're confident that 9, 10 lakhs should sustain going forward. Um, any other growth targets that you can share on revenues, profitability, market share and where does your market share stand at and how has it changed? See, currently in a new client acquisition, our market share is 23%. And when we talk about active uh, client, uh, which is based on NSE uh, formula, which is client who has stated once in a year, we stand it at around 15%. Uh, so what we are seeing is that when we are acquiring customers, if you take a CAGR of last four or five years, CAGR of client equation has been 77%. But if you look at our PAT also, it has grown at a CAGR of around 68%. So okay. as I said, there's a lag effect always when you acquire a customer. But when yeah. we take a block of four or five years, so that client acquisition is reflected in growth. So we are very confident that we would be able to maintain a customer kind of an equation growth of around 55 okay. to 60%. All right, Mr. Tucker, very quickly, you know, I would have liked to ask you about the new fleet of cars that you're looking at for the year. But uh, <laughs> besides that, you know, the street will want to understand you have, your, you have a lot of cash in books now and you're looking at some acquisitions from the fintech space. Should we hear about it in the first half of this fiscal or is it for the second half of the fiscal? So like uh, money that we raised was for uh, growth. Uh, when I say growth, it is continuous growth that we are seeing in our company. Uh, this year, when we started, we were clocking around 42 lakh orders per day. Okay. And by this quarter end, as we reported, it is 86 lakhs, almost a growth of more than 100%. So when a business is doing an ROE of around 44, 45%, and growth uh, for this kind of an, a year, quarter one to quarter four was all, almost 100%. We need mm. capital for our existing business. Having said that, we are look out for entrepreneurs or we're looking out for people who have good solution for our yeah, existing right. customer. And it takes time. Like uh, It is very difficult to say when we would be able to click any deal because there is a pipeline of uh, kind of an, like uh, 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 like entrepreneurs or a small organization or people who have created solution for investors and all that. We are in talks with them. But when that will materialize, it's very difficult to say at this point in time. All right. Uh, 
Mr. Tucker, good luck. It's always a pleasure speaking with you, sir. And uh, thank you've done you a phenomenal job uh, with Angel. So continue to thank you very much. Uh, hope to see you doing uh, as well in 25 as well. Thanks indeed. Well, let's talk about uh, HDFC life insurance, right? The stock's down. Uh, subdued performance in the fourth quarter. Total premium saw single digit growth, while total and re uh, total and retail APE also came in uh, lower for the uh, insurer. My colleague Yash caught up with uh, Mr. Weba Padalkar, managing director and CEO of the company. And they uh, talked about the performance. Yash began by asking uh, Ms. Padalkar about which particular sector did not perform as planned for them in the quarter. Listen. I want to clarify that it went exactly as it was planned. Uh, and let me explain. Uh, we had uh, the budget changes uh, on 1st of February last year. And there was a sunsetting of uh, about 5 lakh premium ticket size uh, that were going to become taxable with effect from 1st of April. Uh, as a result of that, uh, and in a way it might have been a fire sale, uh, our March, especially last 15 days of March, we got an uh, incremental uh, premium income of 1,000 crores, which we had uh, uh, which we had explained and we had carved out uh, to say this is an additional amount that has come in. Uh, and we had a super normal growth and hence a base effect. So if I were to just deconstruct the numbers uh, a little bit, uh, this is for the fourth quarter and, and, and then consequently for the full year. Um, actual growth in individual AP uh, was negative 6%. However, if I back out the 1,000 crores, uh, then growth was 20%. Same thing or similar for the standalone month of March. If I were to look at two-year CAGR, uh, again, for quarter four, uh, that was about 22%. So again, absolutely in line with our expectations. What does that translate to uh, a full year? Uh, individual AP without adjustment was 1%. Uh, and if you dial back, that's exactly what I had said to say that we will be flat uh, on an unadjusted basis. And if I back out the 1,000 crores that was incremental revenue, uh, we will have double-digit growth. Uh, so we ended at 11% uh, for the uh, full year on a, a retail AP uh, and two-year CAGR of 14%. So all of that is absolutely in line uh, in terms of growth. In standalone quarter four, NOPs on an unadjusted basis grew by 14% and on a full year basis, number of policies grew by 11% as against being flat for the previous three years. So we've had a, uh, we've had very good traction in tier two and three. Uh, to give you some numbers, on an unadjusted basis, we grew by 1%, like I said. Against that, the uh, tier two and three grew by 13%. So again, very meaningful inroads that we have managed to do being fairly margin agnostic between tier two and three and tier one. Uh, so there too, uh, we did well. Um, so to summarize, uh, growth is very much uh, in uh, in line with our expectations. If we back out the additional thousand crores of uh, inflow that we got in the last 15 days of March, we managed to make significant inroads uh, as we had desired in tier two and three. Uh, we also managed to grow the number of customers um, uh, by double digits. As far as, uh, you know, AP itself is concerned, FI24, for the full year, if I look at the number, you had guided for about mid-teens number, uh, 13 to 14% uh, growth is what you had guided for. Now, if I take what happened in last year and what happened uh, this year as is, then uh, the number is absolutely flat. Uh, in that context, you sort of missed that guidance. Uh, what I want to understand from you is that was that guidance given, uh, keeping in mind uh, about, you know, carving out this 1,000 crore? Uh, and in that case, uh, is it is it as per what you had expected? Absolutely. And if you uh, look back on any of my, our previous communications, especially on analyst call, it was always double-digit growth backing out the 1,000 crores of additional uh, inflow that came in in the last 15 days. So the double digit growth was after carving out and we have ended at 11%. Now it could be instead of 13%, we have ended at 11% possibly, but I, we believe that 11% uh, that is rich in terms of protection. So protection, for example, has grown by 27%. Uh, so the quality of that growth also is, is fairly good and we are reasonably satisfied uh, with having reached uh, the 11% growth. 
Okay. Uh, another thing that I want to understand from you, and of course, for the full year, FI23 and FI24, uh, the impact of taxation, of course, came on large ticket savings policies, uh, which were more than 5 lakh uh, rupees of premium annually. Uh, just to look at the numbers in terms of how things have changed for an insurer like you, uh, out of your total book, what was uh, the percentage or the share of these large ticket savings policies in FI23? And now as we end FI24, where does that share stand in terms of uh, the percentage number? Yeah, because of the skewed nature of growth. And before I come to the percentages, let me clarify uh, policies in this financial in financial year 24 that were below 5 lakhs have grown by an extremely satisfactory clip uh, of about 19%. Uh, we ourselves frankly did not expect, but our inroads into tier 2 and 3, our granular approach, our um, selling to more customers, like I mentioned, 14% growth uh, that we saw in number of policies meant that our below 5 lakh ticket size uh, grew by 19%. In fact, um, uh, you know, that growth, uh, like I said, has also uh, been a rich growth because of continued growth in protection. Now, in terms of percentage, uh, there's been degrowth in above 5 lakh. So mathematically, uh, we had said earlier that 10 to 12 percent was about the impact of above 5 lakhs. So that's come down to low single digits now. So the industry, uh, you know, in FI24 grew at about 13, 15 percent. Uh, uh, 15 percent is the number that in that case, if that growth continues in FI25 as well, 15 percent AP growth on retail and total AP is what we could see HDFC life as well. Yes. Okay. Uh, now let me come to the value of new business. Uh, uh, here also the guidance uh, which we had was about mid-teens growth for FI24. FI24, we see a cut with whatever impact that we have of, of about 5%. Uh, for FI25, since VNB and the constitutes of it would be in your hand, uh, what kind of growth do you expect in FI25 on the VNB side? I just want to uh, clarify in terms of our new business margin for between FY24 to FY23, uh, FY24, we ended at 26.3% margins. Hmm. Uh, F, the, the previous year, we had 27.6% margin. So there is a, a delta of uh, 130 basis points. Of the 130 basis points, 70 basis points is just, the, again, the 1,000 crores. You had a 1,000 crore uh, uptick, and the incremental margin that we got uh, is the 70 basis points. 40 basis points is because of um, euphoria, euphoric markets that we have seen in uh, towards the end of quarter three and quarter four. And so our unit linked uh, proportion did go up in quarter four from 19 odd percent to about 35 percent, uh, and thereby the dilution in margin. A large part of that dilution was made up by higher protection, but nevertheless, net dilution was about 40 basis points. So 70 basis points because of the 1000 crores and 40 basis points because of the um, the unit link proportion. Um, and you would be able to uh, triangulate this uh, as well, because if you remember, just in standalone quarter four of uh, last year, our value of new business grew by a whopping 69%. That itself showed that the 1000 crore impact had come into that. And so I'm just backing that out to say that we are fairly range bound in terms of where we would have ended had the 1000 crores not come in. Now, moving on to your uh, forward looking question in terms of where we should be, uh, we uh, discussed just now that we will be on the upper end of growth, uh, the, the sectoral growth. Similarly, our V and B should uh, be in tandem with that level of uh, AP growth. A little bit on the distribution side as well. Uh, as far as your total APE is concerned, uh, in FI24, uh, what was the share of HDFC Bank which came uh, to that uh, in, in current financial year? Uh, how do you see that share moving by the end of FI25? And what uh, growth do you expect in terms of sales that come from HDFC Bank in FI25? So, HDFC Bank was uh, about 48% of our uh, retail AP mm. and um, what we don't um, target or pin to is what should HDFC bank be as a percentage. Mm. I want all, all of my distribution channels to grow uh, and so I don't want to again pin something. 
uh, and, and each one could grow at a different pace and what percentage is a particular channel is an outcome, mathematical outcome of that. However, what I do want is that my counter share at HDFC Bank to continue to go up. Hmm. Um, it has gone up fairly handsomely uh, to touch 63%. This is on the entire basis. And if you remember, uh, really discussion started happening after the merger. So uh, this is about eight months of this business has given us a full year target of uh, to a full year counter share of 63%. Hmm. Uh, so hopefully, it, you know, with uh, coming closer and working very closely with the bank, we continue to inch up. However, it is very possible that my agency channel um, grows faster than uh, than HFC Bank channel. You know, it's a very nice bounce uh, which has come through. That's HDFC, of course, HDFC Life uh, in focus. Stocks also recovered, by the way, from the day's low. But so is the market. It's a 100-point recovery from the day's low on the Nifty. Uh, the low was uh, 21,777, and uh, we are uh, at 21,890. Uh, so almost a full 100-point recovery. Strong green candle uh, is uh, what, you, what you have going at this uh, point in time. So, uh, you know, that's uh, it's the first hour, right? Not even the first full hour, which is uh, passed. Market breadth is still negative, four is to one in favor of declines. Mitesh is back with us. Mitesh, uh, just your thoughts on the price action. You were saying earlier that you'd, you'd wait to trade the bounces in, a, in, a, in any significant way. You'd give it time. Uh, so just your observations now. So, Prashant, I think, you know, uh, I was taking the closing chart as a pivot level. And 21,800 has come into some kind of, you know, a support. And therefore, uh, we are seeing that uh, the market has managed to a bounce back but then i think you know i would still believe that the overall structure is negative and therefore not be too uh, you know aggressive in taking long positions right now uh, my belief is that i think you know uh, with this bounce back 21 950 is this uh, to about 22000 is the first uh, support uh, for uh, first uh, supply pivot area i think if that gets taken out then i think you know we are looking at uh, uh, possibly this end of this correction but for the time being the belief is that from those levels we will see supply again so uh, not trading the indices, but closer to about 21.950 is a range where I would want to uh, figure out and see if there's some uh, shorting possible. Uh, having uh, said that, the stock calls which I have, a buy on IDFC Limited, uh, that's the stock uh, to trade on the long side. Uh, buy here with the stock below today's low of 119 for targets of 130. <coughs> and interesting bank is on the negative side, so I have a sell call over there. Uh, sell here with the stop just around the levels of uh, 1470 for targets of 1420. Thank you, uh, Mitesh, for joining in. By the way, even the cuts in Dow futures have eased a bit. In the morning at 8 o'clock, the Dow futures was down 370 points. Now it's down about 270 points so in the red, but uh, just by a lesser magnitude. We'll slip into a break on that note. On the other side, Manisha will put the spotlight on the commodity market. Stay tuned. Welcome back. 21,900 on the Nifty. The top Nifty loser is BPCL as crude prices are still at $89 per barrel. Axis Bank, Bajaj Auto, Tata Motors, Infosys, HDFC Life. These constitute amongst the big Nifty losers, large cap losers this morning. But now let's turn our attention to the commodity markets and get the latest there. Manisha. Well, thank you for that. It's been some morning as we continue to deal with various kind of reports from various uh, areas as well. So, but what we have seen is very volatile morning for many of these tangible commodities. Crude oil price is clearly in focus because day before yesterday, we saw 3% decline and prices go down to a three-week close. But overnight and today morning, we're trading almost 2.5% on the higher side. We did see prices go up by 4% as well at one point in time to almost 90.5%. There are concerns on oil supply disruption in West Asia and Middle East with the kind of reports that are coming in. So a lot of trade clearly is sentiment driven. Having said that, the US has imposed sanctions on Iran and Venezuela and that also seems to be working its way into prices. Iran, remember, the oil exports from Iran in the last year have been the highest in six years. Of course, the sanctions do not or exclude oil companies in Iran, but the markets do believe with what's happening in the Middle East and West Asia, you could be looking at the sentiment continuing or premium continuing on the higher side for the crude oil prices there. Uh, the gold prices also have surged up. We are looking at 
near record highs on to that one as well. After that news that came in in the morning, we saw the prices go all the way to $2,412 an ounce. But from those kind of levels, there is some cooling off as newer reports start coming in and the markets are reacting to this as well. But the major gains continue in case of the base metal as a sector. I mean, April is going to be a second very strong month here. We have seen supply disruptions, improvement in demand. The defense demand is coming in. Infrastructure numbers have been on the positive side. The US dollar index slightly softer from its six-month highs also seems to be supporting many of these metal prices here. So I'll start uh, with nickel where we have seen prices trade at a 29-week highs right now. And we have seen 9.5% of a jump up in last one month. Not just nickel, tin is trading at a two-year highs as well. Here as well, it is about mining disruptions in Myanmar, which are keeping the prices higher. Tin also is used in battery and soldiering, and that is where the demand seems to be coming in stronger. And tin also has seen multi-year highs continuing for the last couple of months now. The other one is copper, and two-year highs onto this one, $9,730 an hour is a ton, is where we are trading onto this one, up 8% in last one month, and the copper prices have been the best performer really in the last 10-15 days. Aluminum is trading at a 14-month highs, 15% of a jump up in last one month. You also have iron ore prices now trading at around 5-week highs and coal is trading at a 15-week highs. Everything that you see in sense of tangible commodities continues to be bought into. Okay, all right. Uh, <clears throat> Manisha, thanks very much uh, for that. Uh, so that is, of course, uh, top of mind as far as commodities are concerned. The other big news story is, of course, the elections which kick off starting today. Uh, we get you a discussion on that uh, when we return. We have senior journalist and political analyst uh, Ninar Seth. We'll also have uh, with us senior journalist Sanjeev Srivastava joining in to talk about this. Uh, stay tuned. Well, as the first phase of the 2024 elections begins today, our team of reporters are on ground to bring you an extensive coverage on how the voter turnout is as of now and how the mood is on ground as well. First up, Jude is joining us from Chennai. Morning, Jude. Uh, tell us, uh, you know, how's the turnout and what's the mood? Well, the long and short of it is that the turnout, at least this time around, is a lot more than usual. We are seeing some ambling of voters as they make their way coming to line up at their nearest whole booth and cast their vote, really. Remember, the voter turnout is traditionally a less than expected as far as Tamil Nadu is concerned. You normally see middling 60s to early 70s in terms of percentages of voters turning out. But what we have been seeing is a number of voters who have been turning out as far as this state and the city of Chennai is concerned, at least in early parts of the morning itself. However, the fact is that a large number of these queues are largely because we have been seeing some malfunctioning of EVMs in multiple booths across the state from the early parts of the morning, which have led to longer queues and longer times taken to vote, really. So that's the ground situation as far as Chennai is concerned. But the fact is that it is indeed a crucial vote for Chennai. Remember, it's a three-cornered contest between the BJP, the DMK and the AIADMK insofar as Tamil Nadu is concerned. And that's pretty much brought these long lines of voters to the poll booth, really, to cast their franchise. Remember, 39 out of 39 seats from the state go to the polls today. There's the extra seat for Puducherry as well in the region. So that's part of the uh, list of constituencies that will poll today. Remember, key candidates as well. The DMK fielding all its incumbent candidates from crucial constituencies like North, South and Central Chennai, including constituencies like Sri Paramuthur, Nilgiris, and uh, a, a constituency like Tutukudi that are seeing names like T.R. Balu, A. Raja, and Kanimori all recontest existing incumbent seats. This even as the BJP is playing challenger by fielding its state president in K. Annamalai from its recent stronghold in Coimbatore, even as bigger names like Pun Krishnan and Central Minister of State El Murugan are being fielded from constituencies like Kanyakumari and the Nilgiris. The AIDM can remember, cannot be counted out simply because the party has a strong position insofar as the constituency or the Kongu region is concerned, which includes constituencies like Dharmapuri, Coimbatore, E Road, and Salem. So, a three cornered contest, well and truly, issues like fiscal consolidation, fiscal allotment, flood relief, 
um, the Kachitiwe Island, a number of issues really at stake as far as Tamil Nadu's vote, voter is concerned. But which way will they go, which way will they go in a three cornered contest? We don't quite know that just as yet. But I guess the next few weeks will tell us. Back to you. Jude, thanks very much. There's a pretty comprehensive sort of snapshot of what's happening in Tamil Nadu over there. Santhya is now joining in with updates from the first phase of polling uh, in uh, Maharashtra. Uh, Santhya, take it away. So, Prashant, I think Maharashtra is the most interesting state when it comes to Lok Sabha elections because of what has happened in the last five years. All the alliances, which the new ones were made, the olden ones were broken. So, this time, for the first phase, five seats of Maharashtra are going to polls. So, uh, and the key seat here is Nagpur. So, other than Nagpur, it's Ramtek, Bhandara Gondia, Garchiroli, Chimur and Chandrapur. Now, obviously, all eyes are on Nagpur because of Mr. Nitin Gadkari. But I think if one seat BJP is the most confident of is Nagpur, uh, because uh, Gad Mr. Uh, Gadkari won the seat in 2014 also and 2019 also with a huge margin. So, reluctantly, this time, Congress has fielded uh, its sitting MLA, uh, Vilas Thakre, from this seat. But the seats which I think are more important in terms of, interesting actually in terms of a cutthroat battle, that is Chandrapur. Now, Chandrapur was the only seat which Congress won in 2019. Suresh Danorkar was the only Congress MP from Maharashtra. Unfortunately, he died last year, so Congress has fielded his wife Pratibha Danorkar from the seat. And now BJP has fielded Sudhir Mungantivar from that seat and Sudhir Mungantivar is the former finance minister of Maharashtra. Now this seat is interesting as I said because that was the only seat which Congress won in 2019 but apart from that this is that one place where BJP is not as strong as compared to the rest of the seats. See the five seats which are going to polls today in Maharashtra are the uh, Vidhar region seats. These are the easternmost parts of the state and the central uh, part of the country. Now other than this another interesting seat is Ramtek. Now, uh, because Ramtek was Congress's uh, strong bastion, uh, you know, uh, before the BJP took over, the swept the whole country, the, uh, Ramtek is another important seat for Congress and BJP. Okay, uh, Santhya, thank you very much. Absolutely, uh, this is going to be a fascinating contest here in Maharashtra. Uh, with uh, the backdrop that you sort of uh, given uh, to our viewers. Abhimanyu is now joining in from Uttar Pradesh, which of course is, uh, you know, perhaps the single most important state, electorally speaking. Abhimanyu, uh, what's the lay of the land there? Uh, well, uh, in the first phase, there are eight seats uh, in the state of Uttar Pradesh which are going to polls. We are currently in Pilibhit, uh, which is located on the Uttar Pradesh Uttarakhand border. It's an interesting seat by means of the fact uh, that the, both the BJP as well as the Indi Alliance candidates who are contesting from this seat are not domiciled here. Uh, and also, uh, there, there have been instances in the past when the candidates who have contested or have won from this seat uh, have have not been domiciles of this particular seat. Now, that's of course which is a prevailing sentiment when we uh, spoke to people. Uh, there was a certain degree of questioning from their end that uh, we often get candidates uh, who are not domiciled here. Nevertheless, uh, till now, around 12.25% 12, uh, 12 voting had taken place till the reports which had come in uh, till 9 a.m. Uh, the turnout is expected to increase despite an increase in temperature in, in the recent uh, few days. Uh, uh, and of course, uh, this is possibly going to deter voters from coming out during the day. However, as, as we have seen in, uh, in previous Lok Sabha elections too, uh, the voting uh, picks up in the evening uh, to, uh, after 4 p.m., after 5 p.m. Uh, so clearly it would be a wait and watch situation how the po polling is going to turn out. As far as the candidates in this seat are concerned, uh, the BJP has fielded Jitin Prasada, uh, who is, of course, uh, a politically experienced candidate. And uh, uh, it's the similar case with uh, the Samajwadi Party Congress, the Indi Alliance uh, candidate, who is also a former MLA uh, and uh, a former minister in the UP government. Uh, the same goes for the BSP candidates. So of course, uh, they are expecting anti-incumbency to help their way. Uh, however, uh, the BJP remains confident of retaining this seat. Uh, when we spoke to uh, Jitin Prasada some time back, he was confident of achieving a victory on this seat. He has replaced the sitting uh, MP uh, on this seat, who is Varun Gandhi. And uh, after 28 years, uh, th there is a situation when uh, there is uh, no one from the Gandhi 
Gandhi family who is in the fray uh, because since 1996 it was either Menaka Gandhi or Varun Gandhi uh, who who had uh, contested from this seat. So it remains to be seen how interesting this con contest is going to turn out to be. Okay, all right. Thanks a lot uh, for joining in and giving us uh, that quick uh, ground check on how the mood is. We'll keep touching base with you all all through the day. Well, uh, let's get in Mr. Sanjeev Shivastava, senior journalist who joins us uh, now. Uh, good morning, Mr. Shivastava, and thanks a lot for joining in. Well, I wanted to talk about, uh, you know, Chennai. Uh, I've been there, I was there for a couple of days, and the feedback that I was getting was very, very mixed. Now, if you're going to see this tally of 400, 350, 400 uh, that's being widely touted, they'll have to make inroads out there. Realistically, how do you see their chances out there? So, um, what did you think of Chennai and your interactions with people there? Do you think well, they're having no, a... No, it was, I <laughs> mean, uh, <laughs> the feedback that I got was very, very wide and it wouldn't want to put a number to it. But the sense <laughs> that you got is they're going to make inroads out there. And in terms of percentage, it's going to be in mid-teens approximately as a vote share. In terms of how much of that translates into votes is going to be very interesting because out of 39... You know, the range could be anything. So, uh, what, what about you? Yeah. So, what uh, what we are hearing about Tamil Nadu is that, like you said, that the BJP is likely to improve its vote share quite dramatically, maybe. Like you said, mid-teens. But will it translate into any number of seats? Uh, it's very difficult to say. I don't think they'll they'll get many seats, uh, if, if at all, in Tamil Nadu. Even see where from where Anamala is contesting... The voting percentage till about 15, 20 minute, minutes back was about 4, 4, 4 and a half percent. So that's not a very enthusiastic vote percentage for somebody if, if he's projecting himself and the BJP wants to project itself as a change agent, then there should be a higher a vote percentage. So I think their vote percentage will go up in Tamil Nadu, uh, unlikely to translate into many seats. That's my perception of Tamil Nadu. And... Uh, Overall, I think this 350, 370 looks way off the, uh, what is reality on the ground. I've traveled a couple of states, a few mm. seats only. But I think we definitely are having an election on. It's a game on. It's not like uh, completely one-sided or the... Because um, very interestingly, it is people still want Narendra Modi as their prime minister. But people are dissatisfied with their MP. And they want to change the MP. And if many constituencies do that, then Narendra Modi may still become the Prime Minister, but not with the, the kind of margin BJP is talking about. All right, uh, Mr. Shabastava, since you mentioned uh, Mr. Anamalai, uh, how do you see that? You know, that's going to be the big focal point in Tamil Nadu. You know, if he can win and if he can win by a decent margin, that stamps his presence as, uh, you know, the state head. So what are his chances, you know? Uh, uh, what, how, how do you expect him to fare? See, the only thing I'll say is Coimbatore is the only seat which the BJP has won in the past in Tamil Nadu. And Annamalai is being talked about is this great new hope, a young uh, uh, person, uh, educated person, IIT, IPS officer background, coming in with new brand of politics, taking on the established order in Tamil Nadu, of, which was a two-party system, AIDMK and DMK, breath of fresh air, as not a family background person, uh, unlike a Stalin or uh, earlier leaders. But will that translate into a win or a near win or a good fight is something I would really be um, not able to say uh, because it's very tough. So the BJP is very good at creating a perception and talking about it, but on ground... Uh, and Tamil Nadu being a new ground, a new area for them. To get a higher percentage of votes is one thing. To win seats would be very different from that. So I, w I would wait till June 4th on that. Mm. Uh, Sanjeev, hi, good morning. Uh, hi, Prashant. So how, wh what about uh, Maharashtra? As Sante was telling us, I mean, this is a complex and an interesting one. Uh, wh what are you picking up? So, <laughs> Maharashtra, from most people I am speaking to, is again a very tough state. Mm. Uh, so, the BJP has got uh, both the NCP and Sena with it. But the question is, are the voters seeing uh, the BJP with the real Sena or real NCP? 
or are they seeing it uh, the bjp with uh, with that kind of a lens that you, okay you broke sena and you broke uh, ncp so and there is a lot of talk uh, which one hears about sympathy for udhav and sharad pawar now again whether sy sympathy turns into votes whether they still have the organizational muscle to get their supporters sympathizer to an polling booth whether ajit pawar's uh, well known muscle and might as an organizational person translate into votes for his party these things are all very difficult to guess but clearly it's not an easy thing for bjp and its allies it's not an easy state it will be a tough contest what i am making out of this election prashant is that uh, this is a real election a street by street battle is on in many places bjp still has an edge people still want prime minister modi as their prime minister for the third term but are they voting on the ground for their mps are local issues dominating on the national issue of seeing modi as the prime minister again for the third time so like in rajasthan um, i see lot of people wanting mr modi but very dissatisfied with their mps and mr modi is having to contest local issues local candidates local perceptions uh, local mood swings uh, so that's a, that's the real context that's where somewhere it is helpful for the opposition that they don't have a face being projected so if it was a rahul gandhi or anyone else against mr modi it would have been so much easier for the bjp and mr modi now with okay. a, a lack of clarity on who is the vikal for the alternative it has become somewhat more muddled and easier for the opposition on the ground if if you can understand what i'm trying to say no no i i i get it uh, we have nidad said also with us uh, nidad we were hoping to sort of get you on a little earlier but uh, tell us i mean we've been talking about we talked about tamil nadu we talked about uh, maharashtra and a little bit about uh, other states you might have sort of heard what sanjeev was telling us but uh, talk about all india what is what is the what is the picture uh, looking like I mean, it's a long election, right? Uh, all yeah. the way from now to the first of June. Uh, so, uh, but, but uh, you know, BJP, of course, has been strong, dominant in its sort of core, uh, not the Hindi heartland belt, trying to make inroads into the South, Tamil Nadu, etc. Specifically, uh, what is your number, if I can sort of boil it down to that, Nina? Number for the whole election? Yes, for the whole election. Well, I don't know. I mean, you know, I'm not the truth there, but I would still say that you know uh, the uh, the fact of the matter is that it's a little bit of history repeating. Uh, there is, uh, I think, there are three issues here. One is the direct connection of Narendra Modi with the voter, which in the general election the Indian elite has generally, you know, under uh, under uh, under understood. Uh, there is a, this first time since Nehru, I would say that there is a prime minister. who has a direct connection with the voter the second i would say you know it's very important to realize that in the global slowdown the indian economy is doing relatively well uh, direct transfers uh, you know uh, agricultural relief and all other measures we will we will now be seeing how they add up uh, because you know bear in mind it is not easy in a fractured country like india with so many different uh, if you like mini polities to go in for a third single party majority that i think is quite unprecedented it is it is it's simply uh, you know unimaginable so uh, you know as for this particular phase of the elections i think it's very interesting that in the northeast bjp is the dominant party you know it wasn't so even uh, in the last election i think in tamil nadu bjp has only 3.7% uh, you know vote share uh, i am not really sure whether it will score even a single uh, you know uh, uh, mp there but the point is not that the point is that if it dramatically increases its vote share then the southern uh, you know comfort starts settling in finally one more thing i would like to say uh, that you know uh, the 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 impact of uh, you know a lot of lot of people are saying that you know the impact of the ram mandir has uh, sort of faded away i do not agree with you uh, you know as countries become richer uh, for example and this is not you know new for india now, if you look at germany germany when it became a 3 trillion dollar economy ever since, uh, ever since then it is ruled by a party called the christian democrats it is not a secular party the party's name is christian democrats now, in american elections the south you know the, the, the christian south has a huge sway so you know yeah. as people and, and, and in india also we are getting more comfortable in our own skin so so i think the ram mandir is a very important issue in this election mm. 
No, 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 no. Uh, my, uh, the, uh, the, so, you know, so let's just invert that question, right? Uh, uh, BJP, of course, is extremely strong, uh, has been uh, very strong in the, in the, in the, in the north, uh, right? Actually, it's been strong throughout, but north, of course, is the core uh, water base. So the point is, can they become stronger or should we look at, I mean, it's the incremental vote which matters, right? So is that, uh, are they going to do better? Will they, uh, what's your sense in, in that sense? That's why I started, yeah, go on. Yeah, in, uh, in Tamil Nadu, I do not see them making too much of a radical change. In Karnataka, right. they're going to surprise everybody, in my opinion, and do very, very well. Uh, so, you know, uh, Karnataka is the real key point. It's the entry uh, to the Deccan uh, for, 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 you know, BJP. And it will be very interesting to see, in my opinion, how the Karnataka effect then translates uh, going, uh, you know, to Andhra Pradesh, going to Telangana. Uh, you know, they are, all, they are doing three things there. They are having a local leadership to rise. They are doing uh, alliances, for example, with TDP. Uh, they, uh, so, 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 you know, the, it's a work in progress. You know, my opinion, in this election, in, from the last time, their tally, I think, was 24-odd. Uh, uh, seats from in the south, I think it will definitely improve. But you're not putting a number to it. <laughs> uh, not I, for, I am not. Uh, I'm not a seat sayer, but I, I you know, <laughs> as a, I, I, would, I would say that it will probably uh, cross 30, 32, 32 perhaps. Okay, uh, Sanjeev, you want to put a number to it? The whole election? Number to the entire election? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Not that I know, but I'll still put one number. Uh, that is that is more like intuitive and my gut instinct. Yeah. I think it would be less than, um, uh, less than 2019. Okay, oh. that's, not a, <laughs> that's not a number, but... Uh, my uh, my, number, my number is 322. Okay, now uh, we I have think 322. Ninad is inspired. Uh, Sanjeev is inspired Ninad. 322, right, Ninad? That's right. No, that's no, no. Right. And, I'm saying about uh, about 270. Two, and this is uh, both of you are talking about the BJP, right? Not the NDA, not the alliance. That's correct. Okay, 320, 322 uh, for for Nina, then uh, two, uh, two, uh, 270. For the BJP. For the BJP. Got it. It's a tsunami, uh, and for the... it's a tsunami alert. It's a tsunami alert out there. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, I think. No, no, uh, Nina is saying there is a tsunami alert out there. So it's a wave. <laughs> well, if it's a wave, then all bets are off. But where I travel, I don't see a wave. Okay. It's a, it's a, and, and many, travel a bit more. Um, you know, many <laughs> and, have. Uh, and having said that, <laughs> most, uh, I have only come to see a wave in hindsight. So. I'll, I come out with that disclaimer as well. You know, <laughs> some people have told us that it's a quiet election this time. I mean, you know, on the ground, it's a, there's not too much. Yeah, usually it's a, is it because it's just maybe too hot on the ground across the country? It's also a long election, right? So you don't want to peak early in, in that sense. Nina, then Sanjeev, Nina, you go first. Do you sense that? And does that have any it implications? Is, it is surprisingly quiet. Uh, you, know, so, you know, I would have worried... Uh, in the sense that if you're an incumbent, you sometimes do worry if it's if it's quiet. But I, I sense that, uh, you know, there is a sort of, how do I say it, a new normal, you know? Uh, I mean, it's a new normal. Uh, there is, uh, you know, the, the opposition, uh, you know, is does not exist. The Congress, for example, in many places, just does not exist. When you do not have an organizational strength, when you do, are not there on the booth level, it becomes very sorry, difficult sorry, to mobilize. It becomes very, it becomes very difficult, uh, you know, to mobilize the mood, if you like, to create, uh, you know, the, the the euphoria, to to sort of, uh, you know, and uh, en enchant your cadre to come out. So to my, in my opinion, uh, in the party systems collapse is in the opposition is very surprising. We should not forget an interesting thing uh, that you know, uh, uh, for, for for example, the Samajwadi Party. In Samajwadi Party. Ever since Akhilesh has taken over, he has never won an election. You know, it is one thing to inherit a party structure. It is quite sure. another to make it work in an in a electoral way. I am not saying, you know, uh, that they, they don't deliver to their constituencies. I am saying in an electoral outcome way. So, so that is very, very obvious that one of the reasons why it is so quiet is that the opposition... Uh, you know, is just not existing on many, in many places on the ground. It's not quite in West Bengal, for example. Uh, you know, the TMC is an existing party which does existing political work. So, you know, it's mm -hmm. not quiet in West Bengal at all. So, you know, I think yeah. that's a very important factor and why it is, you know, it is quiet. And, then, and since you gave the example of a tsunami, let me let me uh, add this. It's, you know, the sea quietens down before a tsunami. 
<laughs> so yes, he I, does. Yes, he's on the spine. Uh, uh, we, you know, we'll we'll have to wrap this up here, but you know we have your numbers, and I have that written down. So we'll have both of you back once we get into the thick of the. As I said, it's a long uh, election season, uh, and and uh, you you know, are, we'll have you back again. Prashant, you are not allowed to embarrass us later. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> All right, thank you I'm very much. I am a Gujarati punter. I am okay if I am embarrassed. <laughs> Great speaking with both of you and getting that sort of sense and feel about uh, you know how you're looking at this election. Ninad and Sanjeev, great uh, having both of you and uh, speak with you soon again. So that's uh, you know a little bit about the election and uh, some of the numbers, of course, uh, which always uh, make the headline a hundred points lower, which means we are down. We are up a hundred points from the day's low as well. So it's not as bad as it was when we opened at 9.15. Uh, the broader market is maybe doing a little worse off. The mid-cap index is down about one and a quarter percent. It's a wrap on this edition of uh, Bazaar from all of us here. Goodbye. Thank you very much for staying with us. More coming up on the other side.